All right, good evening, everybody. I would like to call the Tuesday, November 28, 2017, Gardner Planning Commission meeting to order. If everyone will please rise and state the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now move into roll call starting on my right. Austin here. Roberts here. Mater here. Brady here. Freeman here. Quorum is present. Moving on to the consent agenda. All matters listed within the consent agenda have been distributed to each member of the Planning Commission for study. These items are considered to be routine and will be enacted upon by one motion with no separate discussion. A separate discussion is desired on an item from either the Planning Commission or from the floor. That item may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. Is there any item any member of the commission would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Any item any member of the public would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion made by Brady with a second by Austin that we approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Regular agenda item number one. Plum Creek Manor 2, FP-17-06, consider a final plat for Plum Creek Manor 2, a 78 lot, single family residential subdivision located north of the intersection of West 183rd Street and South Mulberry Street, Harold Phelps, Phelps Engineering Applicant and RC Plum Creek LLC property owner of record. We have a presentation this evening. Good evening, commissioners. Michelle Loniger, Principal Planner. Um, this item before you is a final plat. You saw the uh, preliminary plat for this property earlier in the year. Just to um, reference to where the property is that we're looking at, uh, South Center Street is on the far uh, left of your page, which is the west. And then West 183rd Street is to the south of the property. Um, other um, properties of note in the area. Um, the fire station is just to the south of the property abutting it. Here's some pictures of the property. Um, this is looking southwest from Cypress Street where it terminates into the property from the north. Uh, this is looking southeast from Mulberry Street where it terminates into the property from the north relatively flat piece of property. Um, this is looking northwest from Cyber Street where it terminates to the south. One of my pictures dropped out. Um, this is a visual of the proposed plat for Plum Creek Manor 2. The property is zoned R1 as is the adjacent property to the north, well, pretty much all the way around the property except for um, the city's water tower and the fire station which are at the southwest corner of the property. Those are zoned for zoned agriculture. Um, this is a proposed 78 lot single family subdivision. Um, in addition, they're dedicating a small, it's a pedestrian access tract um, dedicating that to the city for potential future access to that city property. And that's outlined in red on the um, bottom left of your screen. Staff findings that the plat is consistent with the comprehensive plan which identifies the property for single family residential. Uh, the final plat is in substantial compliance with the preliminary plat. Easements are sufficiently provided for for utilities. Uh, excise tax in the amount of $187,276.59 will be levied on the plat for um, arterial street improvements. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple um, of the conditions that are included in the staff recommendation. Um, this is the street tree plan that the uh, applicant has provided. Um, you can see on here 
the uh, sight triangles around the corners. Um, it's always nice to have those included on this so you can make sure that the street trees are not uh, located within there. Um, you'll notice that typically the street trees are outside the property in that um, right-of-way area between the, the sidewalk <coughs> and the street. Um, any of those street trees that are closer um, to that site triangle will be moved in towards the property a little bit more. Um, just to touch on some places where the conditions were added, uh, the proposed street pl tree plan provides the required tree spacing. However, there's room to add an additional tree at the southwest corner of lot, southeast corner of lot 27 to meet the spacing requirements. And that's uh, right here where the red dot is added. Um, code requirement for a minimum of three genus and five species which applicant has met. However, the standard states that no more than 20% of any one species can be included. Um, the plan shows three species that are over the maximum percentage, so that needs to be adjusted. And additionally, if you'll notice, all of the same species of the trees are on the same street. Um, this isn't a code requirement, but we would ask that um, those be kind of mixed so that if we get a um, uh, disease for one specific tree type, you're not losing all of the trees on the same street. Um, it's just a standard practice. Um, additionally, there were some minor changes to the notes that were noted in the uh, staff report. Staff recommends approval subject to the following conditions that the excise tax and the amount stated shall be paid prior to the city prior to recording. Um, construction plans for any utilities, infrastructure, or public facilities shall meet all technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of the plat for recording. Number three, revise the street tree plan to add a tree at the southeast corner of lot 27. Number four, revise the street tree plan, planting note five to read City of Gardner instead of JCW Sanitary. Number five, revise the street tree plan, planting note six to remove irrigation. Um, number six, revise the street tree plan to meet the maximum percentage of one species to be 20 or below, 20% or below. Number seven, revise the street tree plan, <coughs> plan to mix the species of trees along all streets. And then we would recommend that the govern, send it to the governing body and accept the dedication of right away and easements. Great, thank you, Michelle. Do we have the applicant with us this evening? Anything to add, please uh, come forward, state your name and address for the public record. Um, my name's Judd Clausen with Phelps Engineering. I'm here on behalf of Harold and uh, our client. Um, who is uh, proposing this subdivision. Uh, nothing really additional to add. Michelle covered the items, I think, well. Um, no exceptions. This is a kind of a finishing off of an area that is always planned to be R1. So no exceptions. We agree with the uh, stipulations and here to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, uh, questions, comments for staff? We can start over here with uh, Brad. Anything? No. Tori? I don't have anything either. Um, looks good. So I, hearing no uh, questions or comments from the commissioners, I'd entertain a motion on this item. After review of application FP-17-06, a final plat for Plum Creek Manor 2, parcel ID CF-221425-2003, and final plat dated November 2nd, 2017, and street tree plan dated November 2nd, 2017, and staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission approves the application provided the following conditions are met. Conditions one through seven as listed. Oh, and recommends the governing body accept the dedication of right of way and easements. Second. Uh, we have a motion made by Freeman with a second by Roberts that after review of application FP-17-06, a final plat for Plum Creek Manor 2, parcel ID CF-221425-2003, and final plat dated November 2nd, 2017, and street 
tree plan dated November 2nd, 2017, and staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission approves the application, provided the following conditions are met, items one through seven, and recommends the governing body accept the dedication of right-of-way and easements. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Regular agenda item number two, Tuscan Farms. Located south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road, Jim Long, Allen Brand Drews and Associates, applicant, and Chad Berkdahl, property owner of record. We have three items tonight that will be presented separately with three separate motions. We have item A, Z-17-02, hold a public hearing on and consider a rezoning of 82.80 acres from A, agriculture to R1, single family residential and R3 garden apartment districts. We have item B, PP-17-07, consider a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farm, an 82.80 acre mixed residential subdivision, and then we'll have item C, FP-17-07, consider a final plat for Tuscan Farms containing 78, 70 single family lots. Again, three separate motions and three separate presentations. So with that, um, Michelle, turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, Chairman, uh, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Cricks, planner at the City of Gardner, and this evening we're going to be uh, discussing Tuscan Farms, a rezoning request, a preliminary plat, and a final plat request. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give three separate uh, presentations, and then at, after each uh, application, we'll pause for um, discussion and a motion, and then carry on with the next case. So first, um, we're going to touch on the rezoning request which is the applicant is rezoning to request or to rezone 82.8 acres uh, from agricultural district designation to R1, which is single family residential, and R3, which is a garden apartment district for Tuscan Farms, located south of Nike Elementary along uh, South Gardner Road. So in the screen in front of you um, is kind of the overall area here. Um, on the uh, right is kind of more of an aerial view. Uh, you can see Main Street, you can see I-35, and then that red dot is the uh, lo proposed location of Tuscan Farms there at the very southern point of the city. Nike Elementary is located just north of this property. Uh, the property in, uh, the uh, property in front of you is outlined in blue. So we have Nike Elementary directly to the north and then to the south, east and west, um, kind of around it, is going to be unincorporated Johnson County. And then here are the current city limits. The current utilities on site here you see in front of you, um, the uh, yellow is going to represent the current gas facilities in this location. So you can see um, to the northwest corner of the property, you see that there is currently a gas line that runs adjacent to I-35, and then there's another gas line that comes down South Gardner Road. In red um, are going to be um, electric utilities, and then you can see in blue, they are also along South Gardner Road, which will represent the water. Uh, stormwater, sanitary sewer, those are currently not in place, and the applicant will need to install those for the development. So the, uh, the current surrounding zoning, um, because this uh, site is um, surrounded by both uh, incorporated into uh, the city and unincorporated Johnson County, we're dealing with multiple zoning designations. So directly to the north with Nike Elementary, and then there's some raw land, uh, vacant land that is um, owned by the same people who own the, uh, the uh, trailer uh, mobile home uh, just north. Um, those are zoned agricultural on, under the city designation. Um, directly to the east, on the east side of Gardner Road, is uh, considered um, rural residential under the Zon Johnson County Zoning Classification, which is rural agricultural uses and single family residential with a minimum 10 acre lot. Um, you'll see that's the same designation along the south and on um, the west side of the site. Now directly located south of the um, southeast corner of the site 
is um, RLD, which is the Johnson County Zoning Classification for Low Density Residential with a minimum three acre lot size. So we're going to just kind of show you just some pictures of the site um, just to kind of get a feel of it. The picture in front of you is currently the only, only structure that is on the site, which is an old um, vehicle barn. Um, I'm uh, talking with the applicant, this structure is to be removed in December, but that is the, currently the only structure on site. This is a view of the property um, from South Gardner Road looking to the north and west. So this is the very southeast corner of the property. You can see that um, the uh, property is vacant. There's nothing else on it except for that barn. Uh, you'll see basically it's scrub grass, some volunteer trees, um, and it, has, it slopes uh, to the southeast from where I'm at in this picture. It also will slope to the west as well. This is a, a picture taken basically from the barn looking to the southeast. So you can see the scrub grass, you can see the volunteer trees, and uh, some tree uh, brush there in the middle of the property. This is looking to the northwest, so you can barely see the highway, and then you can start seeing the uh, intermodal park from this location. And this picture is going to be on the west side of the property, which was on it, which I didn't wasn't didn't have good access to, but it kind of shows where you can see the tributary, the open, the green, the floodway on the west side of the property. So the applicant is requesting um, to rezone the property from current agricultural designation um, to combined of R1, which is single family residential, and R3, which is the garden apartment district. Um, you can see on the slide in front of you how he's proposing to lay that out. We've got the, um, the single family residential encompasses most of the site, goes all the way around the northwest and south, and there's a small pocket of R3 kind of tucked right in the middle adjacent to uh, South Gardner Road. The applicant is proposing in the R1 that the building types uh, will be the detached suburban house type and in the um, R3 are going to be um, these uh, quad uh, single story um, garden apartments are going to go in those lo that location. Uh, this area um, is subject to the I-35 and Gardner Road Interchange sub-area plan, which is a separate plan from the 2014 comprehensive plan. The uh, sub-area plan was um, is in place to address development in portions of the city of Gardner, or the city of Edgerton, and unincorporated Johnson County. On the graph in front of you um, shows um, from the uh, sub-area plan shows the overall city, which is highlighted in blue, and the sub-area, uh, this the study area of which this plan shows, will show is from 183rd to 199th to the south, from Moonlight to the east to Waverly Road in the west. And um, So in that sub-area plan, it shows on the, land, the future land use map that this area, which is highlighted mostly in yellow, um, to be designated as low density residential. So you look at the graph in front of you, you can see the blue, which is the public and semi-public use, which would represent Nike Elementary. Um, the regional commercial, uh, which is where the Olathe Ford is, that other vacant property that they own that, that tucks around. Uh, Nike Elementary that adjacent to the north property line um, as regional commercial. There's also a community commercial located a little further south and west. And everything in yellow on this graph is going to be uh, the low density residential. The low density residential uh, has been defined in the Gardner Land Development Code as residential districts to promote open space and rural preservation to develop more walkable neighborhoods with a mix of housing types and connections to, walk, to walkable neighborhood centers. Um, as I've stated, that the applicant is proposing two zoning districts for the development, which is the R1 and R3. 
The R1 provides for residential living in a low density neighborhood setting with access to supporting uses such as schools, churches, parks, and other public facilities to reinforce that residential neighborhood feel. The R3 uh, provides for a higher density pattern as a transition between neighborhoods and less and more intense uses. Now there's a the residential goals and policies of the sub area plan do state quote medium density residential use is encouraged not to provide for large scale apartment type development but instead should take the form of small lot detached attached cluster type housing or small scale multi dwelling structures such as two story four to six plexes so the plan that is proposed by the applicant um, and staff's opinion does comply and does follow the goals and policies of the sub area plan Just bringing this map or this graphic back up uh, to take another look at it. Uh, you can see here what the applicant has proposed. So we have the R3, which is being buffered um, by the single family residential on the northeast and south of um, that more higher um, use or higher dwelling use um, than the low density residential. The lots along the south property line, which buffers the R3 from these the larger lots in the unincorporated Johnson County, are much larger lots. They average a little over 19,000 per square foot of lot. So those are much larger, more estate style lots along that um, south boundary to buffer the, um, the R3 from the existing uses to the south of the property. Um, overall, the site um, has is proposed to have 256 dwelling units on 82 acres, which equals approximately 3.1 dwelling units per acre, which is a little over uh, 14,000 square foot of lot size when you average it out over the entire, uh, which you, if you entire over the entire, excuse me development, which is really considered very low density residential when you start th thinking in that terms. Um, so it's reviewing this, the site, is staff's opinion that the site is suitable for the R1 and R3 for the overall site because of the combined use and the low impact. Uh, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission uh, recommend approval to the governing body case Z1702, a rezoning from A, which is agricultural district, to R1, single family residential district, and R3, garden apartment district for Tuscan, Tuscan Farms for the parcel IDs noted in front of you, located south of Nike Elementary and along South Gardner Road. Uh, because this is a public hearing, I'm going to stop here and give the owner or the representative of the owner an opportunity to comment on their project and to allow those into attendance to also come to the podium to speak and the Planning Commission to discuss and make a motion. Since the preliminary plat and final plat that follow tonight for the site is not a public hearing, this will be the opportunity for the public to comment on the site at this time. Yeah, great, thank you. With that, um, we will now open the public hearing so those wishing to speak, um, please approach the podium three minutes for an individual, five minutes for a group, please state your name and address for the record and be heard. Please come forward to the podium, state your name and address for the public record. Thank you. My name is Ron Friend. I live at 1988 Old South Gardner Road. I also own the property adjoining the uh, state lots there. I wanted to say that I had a several meetings with the city and then I also had a meeting with Clint, the owner of this. He was very good to work with. I had a good, good relationship with him because he took them fourplexes out adjoining me and put estate lots in there. The only problem I had, I didn't realize at the time, is the, uh, the lots that he has with fourplexes, which are nice looking, and I, I agree with that, but the problem I have now is they could put anything in there. If he, somebody else, decides to buy that, they could put three-story units and a whole lot of other stuff, which is not a planned development, so I understand I have to live with that. The next thing is uh, the water shed on this. Uh, I have a floodplain coming to mine, and also in the corner where they have designated on the plan, it shows the uh, 
water all coming to that corner that drains that way out of the watershed. But it said at one time they were going to put a dry basin in to let it fill and then go down. But as I was reading the reports and stuff tonight, they don't need that. But if they bring all that water down that all, off of that one, when it's finished up, even that drains into that corner, that's going to come right on across my property. And I have problems with water right now with no old buildings in there. And uh, the traffic is one of the things I'm concerned with. Uh, as I come in tonight, there's a steady line of traffic right now coming from the intermodal trying to get on the highway. And we put that many more houses in there. I don't know how far down we are on interchanges and stuff like that with the city, but that's one thing that really I think we're in bad need of because there's going to be some bad wrecks out there. And the one thing that they've inherited, they, I don't think they showed on the map, and I, if they bring it up a little closer on your map, we have a dump on the back side of that place that I've been working over five years with the county trying to get it cleaned up. And you, the city, is now inheriting that problem. I hope that I can work with you guys a little better than I could with the county. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I do know we've got our city engineer on hand to answer questions, and I know it's, we're, we're in the public hearing motion part of, of tonight's meeting, so I know we've, we've got some answers to some of your questions. I was made aware of that before the meeting. But I think let's give others a, a chance to speak. Don't want to lose sight of your concerns. Thank you. Um, so just know that, that they're noted, and we'll definitely get to that in discussion. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Please come forward. State your name and address for the public record. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. My name is Audrey Sparks. I live at 30056 West 199th Street. Um, my concern is, and I don't know, I know they posted this map up there, but there is a road that comes into our property, and I'm assuming then just dead ends. Eventually, I'm assuming that would be if you would take over our properties and could continue to put housing down in there. But my concern is the water that would come off of that road onto our property, much like um, Mr. Friend, we have water issues on our property. We have a barn back up there. Um, so anyway, that's my concern. And again, I would like to reiterate what Braun said with the traffic out there. I'm assuming you know the roads out there are, it's, it, they have ditches, there's no curbs. Um, so the roads out there are a concern as you're coming into that area. So I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? We've got a nice turnout in the audience tonight, so I'm sure there's others out there. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My name is Lee Warren. Uh, I live at 19770 South Gardner Road. We're the uh, first estate home uh, adjacent to the south of that property, uh, just on the other side of Mr. Friend's uh, property that borders that. Uh, one of our biggest concerns is we're kind of sitting up on, a, up on the rise right there, and we're the first home. Uh, and when we look down on that, we're concerned about what the uh, the buffering or the landscape plans would be for the backs of those homes. Would it be fencing? Would it be natural uh, vegetation that's going to buffer that? Because we'll be able to look right in there. Uh, they'll be able to look right back at us because we're just sitting right on top of the hill. So that, that poses a concern for us as well as to what the plans are in place for, for the surrounding uh, tree plan and, and shrubbery plan and, and landscaping plans for that as it builds out. So that was my concern. Uh, that and along, I will reiterate, the traffic uh, is horrible. Um, there are, every morning I go to work, 6.45, there's traffic backed up out onto I-35. It's just a matter of time before we have massive accidents out there. So it's, it's, it's getting at critical mass now. We add another 250 homes in there. That's two drivers per household. So that's 500 vehicles coming and going onto Gardner Road, South Gardner Road every morning. That's a lot. So if when we don't have that now, we've got three homes, four homes uh, so in that area. So 
uh, traffic is a major concern of ours. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Good evening. Matt Hamilton, uh, 19785 Gardner Road. Um, I, I echo everything else that, that everybody else is saying with regards to, to water and traffic. Um, one thing I would like to, to draw attention to, I know it was, excuse me, uh, agreed in the sub plan that this area would be used as uh, low density residential. It does call out that uh, the R3 medium to high density res residential is not consistent with the sub area plan. Um, I do recognize that, that while uh, that is called out the uh, garden apartments as a whole still fall under the low density plan though uh, do have concern if we are changing the sub area plan to include the R3 how much further would we consider to have future hearings to then rezone um, I would prefer this body C to stick with just the R1 thank you thank you Anybody else wishing to speak? To, is the applicant here with us this evening? Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm Clint Berkdahl uh, with Tuscan Farm LLC. And I'll try to uh, uh, talk about all of those things. Um, one of them, not in any necessary order, in any order, but the uh, uh, little dump that's in the back of the property is there for sure. And uh, that's going to be taken care of when we tear down that building. I've already talked to the uh, group that's going to do it, so that'll be gone um, with the building. Uh, the water drainage issues, I think the city engineer would probably be the best one to talk about that. Uh, we definitely don't want to uh, create any problems for sure. Uh, the traffic, <coughs> um, I've been out the, the road a lot of times coming on and off there myself, so uh, Definitely is a lot of traffic, and I think there's a bigger study going on with the interchange right now, and I think everybody knows something's going to be done with that at some point. Um, the garden district, uh, the garden garden apartments, I know the district uh, calls them garden apartments, but I would hesitate to call them apartments. Um, what they're going to be are single-story attached. Uh, I don't know if you know what a pinwheel design, design is. You see them in... Uh, South Olathe and some other places, but what they what the old, the idea of them is in the past you've seen a lot of duplexes where you just have the garages facing the street and it looks like a row of warehouses. These things, what they do is they cock them sideways to where as you're facing from the street, you're actually looking at the side of the house and you're looking at windows, and people drive in a private drive, <clears throat> um, and then the garages are in off the side, and so you're not looking at. Uh, it's hiding garages is probably the biggest thing that you're doing there. But a few things I'd note about that is that they will be a single story. Uh, they're going to be maintenance provided. Uh, they're not going to be rental, rental apartments or anything like that. They're probably going to cater more towards, <clears throat> I don't think we're going to make it a make it a 55 and old requirement. We're kicking that around. They're probably not going to. But I think that will be the, the predominant uh, buyer of those will be uh, Empty nesters, but, but probably not everybody. Uh, so I think um, the other reason why we did that was not so much to get a uh, high uh, uh, a density. What we uh, did when we talked to the city staff initially was everybody wanted a uh, to step up the uh, game, I guess we would say, as far as subdivisions in Gardner. And... Um, there was talk that we felt like we were losing too many uh, move up buyers to going to Olathe. And so what we did out there in the R1 part and uh, the amenities package is we've got allowances made like in the, in the R1 part, the houses that we're gonna be doing, they're gonna start up there around the school, which is gonna be uh, around the grade school. Those will be more of the um, uh, four bedroom, There'll be some three-bedroom ranches, but mostly four-bedroom houses in the uh, starting at about 300 up to about 350. As we move towards the back, and especially along the edges um, facing the outlying areas where there's going to be some walkout lots, and as time goes by a little bit, we'll be over 400,000 on a lot of those houses out there. And I think that will help capture a lot of the move-up buyers. 
The other thing that we're going to do is we're trying to set a new standard on the amenities package. Um, we've been looking at some other, uh, we're working with uh, a realtor group named uh, Weikert, uh, Graham, Graham Welch, and they've got uh, 25 subdivisions or 30 subdivisions <clears throat> of about 3,000 lots total around the Kansas City area, and a lot of them are down in this area. I don't think they have anything in Gardner yet. But they've got an in-house package, and they're really good at putting all this stuff together, everything from the subdivision logo to the amenities package and the pool designs. And these are not pools like you have seen in the past. I mean, they're really modern, really nice. They've got fire pits. And uh, I had uh, pictures with me that I was going to bring and left them on the table <clears throat> when I left. But uh, what I would say about that is just that we're going to have a uh, – try to do uh, something to attract people here and keep them here but the uh, the pool will be bigger and something you probably haven't seen in town before um, the uh, clubhouse will have an exercise facility in it the uh, there'll be a volleyball no not a volleyball a, a tennis and uh, basketball <laughs> court and a playground that'll be mainly be what that will be there in the uh, the amenities package, but the we're going to copy a couple of them that I've seen that have a uh, the uh, clubhouse right there next to the pool. It has the area for the uh, exercise, but then it's also got a place that the people that live there can. It wouldn't be rent; they'd probably just sign up to use it. But um, like a little kitchen and an outdoor bar type thing right there, to where they can have little pool parties and do things like that. And <clears throat> the Garden departments partly came about from trying to do something a little more modern. That's the other. The second thing I got from city staff. The first one was trying to keep people here from moving, and the second one was trying to do something <coughs> more modern. And within that are single-family houses. We have uh, some modern looks to those, but they're still your uh, your basic single-family house, your four-bedroom. But these um, fourplexes are. Um, the fact that they're uh, maintenance provided, they have really nice landscaping packages. You've probably seen these things around. Um, really nice landscaping package, uh, professionally done, professionally maintained. Um, and so it's not going to be a situation to where there are uh, the last thing that's going to happen out there. This will be protected by covenants and, er and everything. The last thing that's going to happen out there is a bunch of rentals with people put, storing their stuff in the garage and cars in the front like you typically see. That's exactly not, that's not going to happen. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing a few things, but um, any questions I can address to anybody, I, I would uh, do so. Oh, the gentleman that was talking about the uh, landscape buffer, uh, that's a good point. Um, I know uh, we're, we're doing that along Gardner Road to start with. There's going to be uh, there would be a nice uh, entrance monument, and there's going to be extensive uh, landscape buffering along there, and it's, it is going to carry around to the south. And on the west, there's nothing around almost all of that. I think part of that even goes into woods and floodplains, so those would be some really nice private lots back in there. But I think that is uh, it's a, good, it's, it's a good concern. I think it's something that we definitely want to do. So any questions anybody has, I'll uh, try to answer them. Great. I, I think uh, for now we'll hold off on questions until okay. we get a little further in the process. If we uh, question get all, to that all point. three apartments are those purchased then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, they're uh, townhomes. Is what what they'll be. And, and the square footage on those? Those are about fifteen hundred. They'll be. A, they're going to be. Um, they'll be a quadplex of a buildings. What they'll be, and in each building will have four of them. And they'll be. Each one of them will be. They're going to be two different styles of plans, but there'll be a two car garage and about a 1500 foot um, one and two bedroom and they're going to be on basements with the option to uh, finish just like a reverse ranch with the option to finish two bedrooms and a living room in the basement so they'll, they'll be uh, they'll be really nice the other thing we're going to do i don't want to force it on the subdivision but we're going to offer an option the same company that we hired to do the maintenance provided for the uh these uh, the four plexes, we're going to offer that as an option for everybody in the sub subdivision. I don't want to force it on it because I found that a lot of you know a lot of the younger people don't want to do it and people still want to mow their yard, 
but get, give it an option because I think that will also – there's been, a new market has opened up in the last five years, definitely maybe maybe ten, of uh, – it used to be people that wanted to go into the maintenance provided thing had to go had to the only thing that was available was either going to an apartment or something like like these but there has there's a big market now for people that um, had a pretty decent sized house their whole life and they do want to uh, downsize a little bit but they really they, they, they like the maintenance free thing and but they want it in a single family house version and they don't want a little tiny one so what we're going to do is offer that as a as a an option for people to do that. Anything else? Okay. No, thanks. We're good for now. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? I would like to. Great. My name is Mike Kale, three zero one five eight West One Hundred Nine Eighth Street. I'm a traffic guy. I would say within the last month. Twice I've not been able to get in Gardner due to a wreck at 191st and I-35 due to the intermodal. Plus, there's been at least two accidents at 199th and Gardner Road, where I live, due to all the traffic. My big concern is, and I know the intermodal is separate from all this stuff, we've got a terrible traffic problem. My big concern is, you know, what are we going to do out there if we're going to put a bunch more houses out there? I can't hardly get on Gardner Road now to get into town. We have all these extra houses out there. City Garden have to figure out something so at least me and my wife can get to work in the morning without having to detour around, go to the back roads. That's my main concern is traffic. You know, what are we going to do about the traffic? Right now it looks like there's going to be one way in, one way out. Uh, even if there's just 70 houses starting up front, there's still how many cars? maybe 35 cars additional each morning trying to get on Gardner Road. That's my main concern. So right now, like when you go to work, or you, you say you take the back road, you be going east on 199th Street to take the back roads to get in town or to Moonlight yes. or something? Yeah, or go down to Moonlight, cut across. Uh, but yeah, there's been twice, like I said, in the last month. So I want to go in Gardner, on Gardner Road, while I get down to those accident by the Shell Station, so I have to take a right, go down the next exit, to go into Gardner, which I know that's an intermodal problem. But we got a major traffic problem out there. My main concern is where are we going to put all the cars? Uh, I know I don't know if it's a state deal with the I-35 or whatever city deal. I'm not sure what it is, but we got to figure out somehow. So if we're yeah. going to have a lot more houses out there. What are we going to do with the traffic? It's yes to both on whether it's a state and a city deal and the counties involved. It's yes to both. So the state has to be part of it, and that, that's where their hands are tied in. The council, I think, just in the last meeting, actually authorized the study for traffic mitigation and revamping that, uh, that intersection. So, yeah. um, But you're, you're right. It is difficult, but it is the state because it's a state highway. We can't do any of it on our own, right. which means time-wise. Right. That's my, my main concern. Absolutely. Traffic. So we yeah, need to look we, into that. We have the, the city engineer here. If there's anything you'd like to weigh in on, feel free. This is probably a good time within the public hearing. I'll go take a seat. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kyle. Sir, um, yeah, Tim McEldonian, the city engineer. Okay. I was hoping I didn't really want people to hear me. So, yeah, Tim McEldonian, the city engineer. And um, with respect to traffic, um, the uh, the applicant has done a traffic study and uh, per our our access management code and uh, yes there is additional traffic there and um, the one thing they the traffic study did show is that um, a southbound right turn lane is needed um, at 196th Street so that'll be part of the public improvements that they do on this um, as far as you know you get up to the interchange and yeah we obviously have a huge problem there today and um, and has been mentioned um, it, that we have a, a design contract that is about to uh, actually it'll, it'll go to next council for approval and we'll start uh, work on that so rather than have them um, y you know I got information from them on how much traffic would be sent towards the interchange from this development but rather than have them do any kind of analysis at the interchange 
We're going to have our consultant who's designing the interchange wrap that in with everything they're doing there. So unfortunately, I mean, we're we're probably three years away from doing or two years away from uh, starting construction in that area. Now, um, we're also we'll have our consultant do some preliminary work to see if there's any kind of um, improvements, uh, minor improvements that can be made to the interchange and the ramps in the meantime. Uh, but we, so far, we haven't found any really reasonable solutions for that. But we're continuing to look look along those lines. So we're we're still a ways away from a real um, uh, final solution on it. And as far as uh, Garden Road itself, it's uh, two lanes. But the the I know there's a lot of traffic there, but it's the amount of traffic on there today is is well within reason for a two lane road. Um, eventually. Uh, you know, that's an arterial road, and uh, it'll eventually be probably four lanes. Um, our arterial standards could be three lanes, but in most cases, it would be like what you see on Moonlight, Moonlight Road, four lane divided. Uh, again, that would be someday in the future, and they'll be driven by um, other, um, other development and, and just traffic flow in general. So I, I don't know if that helps somewhat. <coughs> Tim, can you speak to any of the water issues as you've reviewed the plan? Yes, um, we've received a, um, a study for stormwater. And again, our requirement for, requirement for stormwater is that the post-development uh, runoff flow rate can't be greater than the pre-development rate. And typically, that's handled by detention. Okay. And um, again, we have not completely reviewed that study yet. Uh, what I saw glancing through it was yes, there was a recommendation not to detain any water, uh, but we'll, we'll vet that out. We'll actually have another consultant review the study, and uh, again, we have not approved the study that they have submitted yet. Great. Thank you. While we're still on the record and in the middle of the public hearing, would anybody else like to speak before we close? Great. I'm Lori Warren. I'm at 19770 South Garden Road. Um, my first question is, is um, you talked about doing a, a study on the traffic flows. What time do you do those, between 8 and 5, or do you go between 6 in the morning? Because as everyone's reiterated, um, if you sit out there between 6 in the morning and 8 is when it's the worst. Um, and if you start doing your traffic studies when everyone comes to work between 8 and 5, you're not going to see how awful the traffic is. So I would... I'm, I'm very concerned that you say that that's, that road can handle the traffic that's on it because I, I work from home and I count cars and count trailer trucks and I, no one believes me how many people are, are coming through that road. So just would caution against saying that you've done a study or what times have you done your study to see people coming, coming on and off the roads. And if you say that something's not going to happen for two to three years, if he gets approved, when is he going to start building houses? I mean, someone's going to get killed there. So, anyways, um, my second issue is is that if he is approved tonight um, for the R3 fourplex apartments, um, let's say that he walks away and doesn't um, build the fourplexes, um, it's approved for R3, which are apartments. Can a different style of apartment go in there? Would be my concern, because I I really like what he's talking about about his fourplex apartments. But if it's approved tonight for R3 apartments. Um, that sounded like it was kind of wide open for different apartments, and if he doesn't develop, um, you guys have approved for apartments to go in there, so I'm quite concerned about a different apartment complexes coming in there. So, right. thank you. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak before we close the public hearing? No one else coming forward. I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Motion to close the public hearing made by Freeman with a second by Brady. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. The public hearing is now closed. Uh, commissioners, questions, comments? We've um, heard from um, citizens, which is great. Um, definitely have some concerns. I think we've had some good discussion dialogue. We've got the applicant here. We've got the engineer here. So. Heath, I'll maybe start down sure. on this end. Um, what questions do you have? Comments? Yeah, Reason. a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, one of the things that uh, Ms. Warren and, and, and Mr. Hamilton talked about was the concerns with an R3 zoning and what happens with that. Uh, as I see it as a planning commissioner, uh, it is one of the calculated risks that we have to take with something like this because as you look at it, Mr. Burkdahl talked about, you know, a plan I think that is needed with the second tier of, of housing for an aging population that might still want to stay in Gardner but wants to take those amenities on. We can't accommodate that without R3. So we can't, we can't, we either have to say no to that type of development and deny the rezoning or we have to rezone it with the expectation there. And it does leave us in a spot where someone could bail on that. And it's an exposure I don't know how that we can reduce as a city uh, uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. We've asked before if there's contingencies in place with the zoning based on that sort of development as proposed, but I don't know that there is. So that would be a question for, for legal from, friends. From the zoning perspective, no. Your first question, you have three three items here before you. And so you, you are in the situation where you have a, the zoning and that designation you cannot place those conditions upon. Right. Upon your, your plat, approval of the plats, approval of the plans, you may place conditions. And so that there's the distinction. The zoning is the, the first steps right. in the process. And no, that's not subject to those conditions. If things change, it may be rezoned through the same process in which it's being zoned now. I, I guess that's to just say, it doesn't mean it's forever R3, right. but it would have to be changed through the same public hearing process and recommendation from the Planning Commission to the governing body. Thank you. And, and so. For me personally, as I look at it, when you have a sound plan, and especially when it almost, in essence, though I hate to use that term, but it is an, an island zoning from the same developer where it's surrounded on three sides by the same developer, same property owner with plans, I also think that lessens the risk. So in this circumstance, we're working with the same developer with a plan that is appears to be well thought out and, and well intentioned with a, a, a dire need from my perspective for the city. That's when I think it's appropriate to do that. Um, from the traffic, there's nothing that we can do to hide from that. The, the traffic on that intersection is a disaster waiting to happen. But I personally think the worst thing that we can do is wait until it's resolved and hold everyone there hostage and in a, a holding pattern because of the time involved. And, and traffic will increase, but there's already a school there that drives a lot of traffic and we, we can't wait because the intermodal forced our hand to where we're in a situation that does take time. I, I hate to say we can't do it until because then you're always waiting for the next piece to fall. So the, that traffic is, is an animal of the intermodal itself that the city and the state and the county are all going to tackle together. I don't know how long that's going to be, but we can't let that stop us from what otherwise is sound development, which I think this plan is and plan is needed. So uh, I, that's to address a couple of the questions, my own personal thoughts on it. The water control, I think, is an issue, but I, the studies and such, you know, you have to depend on studies when, you, when you're trying to predict these things, and those are the experts that will let us know if, if there is a concern, and they haven't at this point. So I have to, to, to fall back on our staff recommendations and, and those professional recommendations that those things will be accommodated. So those are my thoughts on it. Okay, great. Tim? First of all, I want to say thank you to our patrons who are here tonight. You are all very informed and passionate about this very difficult topic. Thank you for being engaged in, in this. We've, I've only been on the commission for just over a year, and oftentimes we do not have our community members show up for these type of issues. And so we, we applaud you, and we've, we've learned a lot from you. And Mr. Burkdahl, is he still there? I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he's he still is. back there. Exactly. And thank you as well. Uh, you helped provide some clarity. Uh, on this whole matter and, and, and gave us some, some balance. Uh, I do want to echo some of the comments that, that Mr. Freeman shared with us. I, I do agree with many of those. Uh, I do have some questions though. One for Mr. Mr. Burkdahl, when would you start on this project? We're going to start on the first part immediately. The first uh, final plan. Come, yeah. come, come, come to the, yeah. the podium so we can catch up for the, the record. Thank you. Yes, we will. Uh, 
we're final plotting 70 lots. Um, actually, it's the third item tonight. So we'll start on 70 houses. So it'll probably take roughly four months to get the uh, infrastructure and streets in. And then uh, probably start with six to eight houses. And then it's just going to depend on what the market does. But it, it is starting immediately. So if I had to. So 2018, you would anticipate houses up and people moving in? <clears throat> if, yeah, I've been working on this. I would say um, we're not going to get asphalt until, you know, let's say April mm -hmm. because of the weather. And we may, I may, if we can, get a little bit of uh, some foundations in before that. But if you're looking at maybe starting in April and four to five months to get the first houses built, you're not going to get anybody in there until probably first of September. And then I would say um, just getting these things started, that's going to be probably six. I would say by the end of 2018, you would not have more. I mean, I, I wish we would have more, but probably not going to have more than six occupants there through the end of 2018. And then figuring conservatively, um, one a month would put us at 12 throughout 19. If it goes to two a month, it would be 24. So th through the, through 2019, again, I just don't uh, know. Part of the <clears throat> part of the site is perfect for development because it has excellent access. I know we're talking about traffic, but it has visibility and access from the interstate. But it's, there's also a grade school right there. Um, the part that a little bit is unknown is across the interstate. The first you know the subdivision of this type across the interstate. I'm not sure how fast it's going to go. Can you address the buffering a little bit more? You talked about some, some fencing and, and, and all that along Gardner Road, I believe. But I think maybe some of our patrons were talking more on the south side. Uh, so what, what, are your, what are your plans there? Well, I did see a tree line, I believe. It's a little bit of a tree line. I don't know if it's that so, so. Not really full, is it? Yeah, along the thing there, yeah. Is there a pretty good tree line on the oh, south side? South side. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think there's a good picture, yeah. Michelle. <laughs> yeah, um, what I I, don't, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't fence it. I think people when they come in. One thing I am going to do, and I think this will help some. I, I, I think this will help. Uh, you see, in some subdivisions where they put up the six foot privacy fences, a lot of the subdivisions I've built in the higher end ones, they won't allow that. They just put it. They, they'll only allow a four, a four foot fence because. The six foot fences end up almost defining everything. You've just got it broken up into these fences, and everybody's got a different fence. So I'm not going for a fence look. And I'm not suggesting that either. I, yeah. I do think some of those, the not tree line that's there, it's, I mean, it's just it's a bunch of old trees it's from what I saw. It'd be nice if those could be torn down and, and put a nice tree line along that. And I don't know how our patrons feel about that, but I think that would be much more attractive, not only to your property, but also serve as a nice buffer. Uh, to, to the south. No, I definitely agree. I, what I'm seeing along Gardner Road will be more of a landscaping berm type thing that you would see. You've seen you've seen seen those yeah, things a yeah. lot. So it'll be a, something we probably have like Epic Landscaping come in and design something with the subdivision monument and do like a berm and a, a big uh, kind of a production there on the south side. Um, you know, berms are an easy thing to do. You think berms would be something that would would help from your standpoint to keep yeah, uh, definitely just totally define get, your area and our area and, just, and also yeah, maybe get some elevation, kind of just elevation so berms right are really down. easy i mean that's something where you got a big site like that yeah. you just push some dirt around so you can get the elevation easily so sure. i'm definitely open to something like that uh just a couple last couple couple things here um any communication with the school district uh from the city's part or from your part in terms of how they feel about you know, additional traffic and safety or anything like that? Yeah, I had a, a conversation at uh, <clears throat> the last meeting I was here. Do you remember the time? The, what, what did we do? We, the annexation meeting. And the, the um, I think he's the uh, superintendent or there's a representative from the school district that night. And he was 100% for it. And he told me that. I sit back there and he'd come over and talk to me afterwards. And the, he was 100% for it, wanted it in. I don't remember the guy's name. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Portnell. Sure. And then just finally, just so our patrons know, whatever's decided here, we are not the final decision. This would go in front of our city council. So whatever decided here, if you don't like what's decided, there is another venue, another opportunity for you to share your sentiments. Tori? Well, um, I pretty much agree with 
with Commissioners Brady and Freeman. Um, what really concerns me is obviously the traffic, um, but also the water. Um, I know there's a study, but Gardner is so flat, and if there's already a water problem now, it. I think that I know there's going to be another study, but that's really concerns me. The water. Um, I think it's a welcome addition to Gardner because I over and over I keep hearing that people are leaving Gardner because there's not that upper level house. You know, they grow out of their house, so I think it's needed in Gardner. But I echo what everybody said. I'm concerned about the traffic and I'm concerned about the water. Okay, Brad. Um, well. Not to sound like a broken record, the, I think we all agree that traffic was a concern and water runoff was a concern. Those are the first two things I thought of when I first started looking at this. However, uh, I also agree that the traffic problems that we have in that area and especially at that intersection, while they, they may be worsened to an extent by this development, are not the result of this development. and. And in my opinion, I think as Commissioner Freeman indicated, it's it's not something that we should hold developers back on while we're trying to get those solutions put in place. Um, I I do agree it's a headache for everyone to to work through as it's being designed and, and developed. But another aspect of looking at that is more traffic. Um, demand is going to also drive expediency on the design and construction side, uh, potentially more so than if we didn't have a development plan for that area, um, at least for those outside of the city, because everyone here acknowledges the, the, the issues that we have, but we also have to convince the state and the county and other folks that this is a big problem. So um, I think that it, it'll be a challenge as you know, in in the next year or two, but as that intersection gets redeveloped and as Gardner Road gets redeveloped, um, hopefully we can subside those issues. Uh, from the the water perspective, uh, they'll have to do a, a you know they're doing their their study and they'll have to do their uh, development plans and and all of the detailed design work on their their lots, which the city will. Uh, ensure that they comply with our requirements to not make things worse. Um, so that may impact, and I guess that was a question for staff, is if the results of that impact where they need retention or detention and it affects the, the layout of the lots, does that, is that something we need to be concerned about tonight? And I know we're talking about zoning first. Um, but, and we can hold that question until we get into the class if you want. Um, seems like I have one more. Oh, on the, and I didn't think to look this up before I came tonight, and hopefully you've got it at your fingertips. What is our R2 district allowed? Is that only allowed duplexes? Is that why we can't have? It doesn't allow more than two or three family, I think, if I remember correctly. The R2 zoning allows two different types of detached residential units and duplexes. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I think we've talked about this in, the, in other areas <coughs> where we have a three or four plex that really looks like a oversized duplex and will probably fit better in an R2 than an R3, but based on how our definitions are, it doesn't work out that way. Um, maybe something we should look at in the future, but I don't know that I need to initiate anything on that at this point. Um, I think my other question doesn't have to do with zoning, so I'll wait on it. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any other specific comments except just to say thanks for um, coming out and speaking. It's really giving us the commission um, insight into concerns that are brought forward and to make sure, you know, we can put in stipulations to address those concerns where we 
we might have them. Um, the, the public hearing's closed, but if you want to make a, a quick comment, I don't mind that. Mary. I'm Mary Fran, 19880 South Gardner Road. Um, and for Mr. Burdroff and the city, um, we have been told that Johnson County is widening Gardner Road. Put in an easement, five on each side. They're coming down our driveways. They will tear out if we have plantings or trees or shrubs or any kind of monuments. They will tear that out. I don't know when that's going to happen, but if this gentleman makes a nice entry to his subdivision, say next spring, and then the county comes through in the fall and tears that all up, I'm just, is the city in conjunction? Is your side of Gardner Road on the west and the, the uh, east side of Gardner Road would be county? So if they do do that, do you work with them to say when they're going to do it? Because they have been to our property, they've talked to us, they're taking more easements and they're going to put a five foot on each side and a certain slope requirement and all that. And I just didn't want him to go to a lot of expense of putting his nice entry in to find out they're going to tear it out and move everything. That's all I have to say. Thanks for the, the concern. Yeah, that's a, definitely what noted, very well noted. Thank you for bringing that up. If we don't have other questions or comments um, from the commissioners on the rezoning, um, I will entertain a motion on the item. I guess I did have one more thing on the rezoning, sure. um, and that'll give us time to find our wording on that motion. Um, I think Commissioner Freeman touched on it as well, but we, while we can't control what goes into an R3 district, we do have the review of the, the plat and plan process. So if the next two steps of what we'll look at tonight, um, if we approve those, and then something does change in the future and, and those four plexes don't get developed and it will come back in front of us again uh, for additional review and, and discussion. So it, while it's not a guarantee, it, it at least allows that additional point of uh, contact. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? Wait, oh, another question? Sure, really quick, that'd be great. Thank you. I know I took about five minutes up. It's all right. <laughs> uh, I'm not keeping track tonight. The question I have, and I know I think things have changed. I spent 19 years on the planning commission here in the city of Gardner, but at one time did they have a planned district? That's where we could designate, you know, we went in for the R2 or R3, and the man was going to do this here. That if he changed that, he had to come back. And what that protected the next guy that bought it, he could not come in and change everything without. And I didn't know. I mean, I'm agreeing with what he's doing. I, don't get me wrong. But I'm just worrying about the big three story apartments and right. filling the thing out if that next guy comes in. And the property is for sale. I don't know whether you know that or not. And, uh, and everything is for sale at price. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. So was there, did you want to comment on that staff yes. as to why we didn't, I know we have the different designations and I know our land code just changed a couple few years ago, but did you want to comment on why we're going with the uh, designation, you know, just the R3 versus the, the planned, um, any, anything to comment on that? Uh, well, that's what he asked for. Yep. Uh, traditional zoning district, a okay. uh, plan district, is generally to do um, to accomplish innovative development, something unusual or unique. Um, he's doing exactly what you know we're asking for in our code. So there was really no need to go with a plan district. Um, if the only reason he would have to come back for review is if he changed the lots and then the, the final plots that are approved in the future don't match with the preliminary plot that you approve now. Okay, so, you know, there are other limited building types that could go in that R3 district that's in that little core or island surrounded by the R1. The R1, of course, is very limited. So, hopefully that clarifies it. That helps. Any 
Anyone else have, have questions real quick? If not, I'll, I'll entertain a motion if anyone's ready to make one. After a review of KZ 1702, a rezoning from A Agricultural District to R1 Single Family Residential District and R3 Garden Apartment District for Tuscan Farms, parcel ID CF221502-3001, CF221502-2013, CF221502-3011, 2F221502-4009, 2F221502-4007, and 2F221502-4001, located south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road, and a staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission recommends the governing body approve the application. Second. We have a motion made by Freeman with a second by Austin that after review of case Z-17-02 rezoning from A Agricultural District to R1 Single Family Residential District and R3 Garden Apartment District for Tuscan Farms parcel ID CF-221502-3001, CF-221502-2013, CF-221502-3011, 2F221502-4009, 2F221502-4007, and 2F221502-4001, located south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road, and a staff report dated November 28, 2017, the Planning Commission recommends the governing body approve the application. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Moving on to the uh, the next item 2B, which is uh, PP-17-07. Consider a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farm, an 82.80 acre mixed residential subdivision. Staff presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Cricks, planner with the City of Gardner. And now we're gonna uh, touch upon um, the applicant's request for approval for a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farms on 82.8 acres, located south of Nike Elementary and along South Gardner Road. So before you is a uh, copy of the preliminary plat that the applicant has proposed, which is showing uh, 221 lots for both single family and the garden, bar garden apartment building type. 207 of those lots are proposed, to be proposed for the detached suburban house building type. Um, so those would be the lots um, that um, in the previous uh, case were those uh, in that orange that go along the north property line, out to the west, and along the south property line. Uh, 14 of the lots, um, which is um, in that center there along South Gardner Road, are proposed for the garden apartment building type. Um, these are proposed to be uh, maintenance provided and owner occupied uh, units. The applicant is proposing two access points um, from Gardner Road into the development. You'll see one access point there just south of Nike Elementary and then a little further uh, uh, to the south there is a second entry. Um, all roads within the subdivision are to be public roads. Um, the drives accessing the, um, those quad units there in the middle are proposed to be private drives. Um, the applicant has also proposed nine, tra uh, nine tracts of land uh, for the overall development. So on your screen, those are the areas highlighted in green. Eight of these tracts are to be owned and maintained by the Homes Association. So along uh, South Gardner Road, uh, there are landscape tracts. Um, there's um, centrally located within the development is um, 
the uh, community amenity tract, uh, which will have a pool, which will have the clubhouse, as the developer alluded to in the, with the previous case. Um, and uh, bicycle parking will be provided there as well. There's a pedestrian access track um, to Nike Elementary, and then there's another pedestrian access track along the west to the green space um, on the west. Now, Tract E, which is that large area on the west side of the development, which is on the left side of your screen, um, is proposed by the uh, developer to be dedicated to the city of Gardner for future parks and trails. This tract is approximately 5.12 acres. Um, it is part of the 100-year floodplain, so because it's within that floodplain, um, it uh, cannot be developed. Um, the dedication of this open space does comply with the open space goals and policies of the sub-area plan. And uh, staff has had conversations with the uh, city parks and rec department. And the department is supportive of this land dedication. And they plan to, um, in the future, construct um, a 10-foot pedestrian bike hike trail that will eventually connect to the north when the north um, develops and then onto the south and west as well so we can continue to grow the trail system within the city. The development is proposed to be um, developed within three phases. Uh, the first phase is going to be that area just um, just uh, south of the north property line there. The second phase um, will include the qu those quads, the um, more estate-sized lots along the south property line, and then some of the traditional single-family lots through the middle of the development. And then the final phase um, will be the remaining single-family lots um, at the south and west of the development. Uh, staff is recommending the Planning Commission approve case uh, PP-1707, a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farms uh, with the parcel IDs noted on the screen, located south of Nike Elementary on South Gardner Road. Again, I'm going to stop here uh, to allow the Planning Commission an opportunity to discuss and ask questions and make a recommendation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, commissioners, anything on the prelim? Any questions? On my left, either Tim. No, I don't think so. Okay, Tim. Mr. Workdahl, is that true? The property is up for sale. <coughs> Technically, it's it's. It well, will, it is or isn't. Well, it is. <laughs> it has been for sale for a long time. And we, uh, the only reason why it's even still for sale is because I was trying not to cut the listing realtor out until he ran out of his term. So, but we raised the price way up. And so, actually, the only thing we were waiting on was this, and it's 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 getting uh, it's going to be done. The listing will be off. The only thing that will be listed after that will be um, possibly lots. We're kicking around whether we're going to build all the houses, but it will be going into sale as advertising for lots, but as not as the not as the property. And then it was also brought up with the county, and state, maybe expanding Gardner Road, that if they do that, that's going to tear up east side of, the, of, of your property. Is, is, would that happen? I think they are. You would know more about it than I do, I think. But have they already figured that in with the right-of-ways they're at now? Do you think we're, we're okay on that? They're, um, I know they, if they're needing more right-of-way, they, they've obtained it through that project. Essentially, they're just they're adding shoulders, and uh, which will move ditches out a little wider. It's, a, it's just a it's it's not a roadway improvement; it's a safety improvement. To, but that's only in the unincorporated, correct? Well, the project goes all the way up to almost 191st Street. 191st. Oh, it does. Okay, side, so it is changed. coming into the but city limits, not, but, but it's a county project. Right. Okay. But they're, but they're not doing the widening within Gardner. That they're only doing the widening with the shoulders on the uh, in the unincorporated Which part of the project. Which wouldn't affect this rest property of, on your eastern side. Yeah. Because it's in the city now. Right. When it, but when they started developing plans, it was not. So and, it may and, still be part of those plans. I see. Right. And and I've been in touch with the county, and we'll continue to to keep them informed where we're at. So, uh, I mean, that was a good point, you know, so that we're coordinating with what's going on with, with what they're doing. Well, I think the, the big question with that is, is there 
current right of way wide enough to accommodate those future developments without having to redo all of their current designs. And if we're approving the preliminary plat that shows those right of ways, then it may be good to know that. Larry's working on it. Okay. Thank you. We're, we're checking on the additional right of way width for you that we did request, so we should probably have that covered, but we'll give you the footage in a minute. Okay. Thank you. While she's checking, and I don't know if this should be part of the motion or not, but I'm pretty passionate about a berm or tree line on that south side. Would that need to be part of the motion? I think we could do that with the, the final because uh, we can maybe. And, and keep in mind, too, that's just the final plan. We haven't even got to the development plan, which that will come with another step. Right. Ron, you still, is Ron still here? Yeah. Ron, what, still here. from your perspective, tree line, berm, what? That was the Warrens, but he can probably. What they're talking about uh, extending the road out well, there. No, now I'm kind of moving on now. We're talking but there about is the, also uh, the, the road buffer part. On the, on the south end of this property. Oh, okay. Lee and Lori. So are you thinking tree line? Are you thinking I like the idea of have these berm with your trees and stuff on the berm like they do. That adds, you know, height to the whole situation. And the city, Larry? Well, I would defer to the, the city engineer on this, but it's, we have to be careful when you start berming property, you block water and we can't change the natural flow of the waterway. So even though we may berm it so that we raise the trees up, there still has to be the natural water movement that's required for the properties to move where it's supposed to go. So it would just be taken into account that you would you may have a berm, but it would be a berm that allows the flow of water through it. It's not going to block the water flow. Yeah. When the watershed is finished there with the, all of the natural drains you know shedding for all the streets actually that's putting all of everything that drains on us right now everything is going to go to that corner the way i looked at it on the prints if i'm correct i think wasn't that right we went to where we thought we were getting a tank containment area it showed all of the uh, storm surge going into that one point well a lot of the development is draining off to the west. We talked the west, about that. Not, Remember, that would be about one third of the whole district will go. No, west. I think Mark's indicated it's more like two thirds. Yeah, I think larger ones going west. Wasn't that on the on the sheet you gave me that you showed the amount of water would go which way and stuff? Well, he was showing you on the on the plat. Yeah. Which parts of it would go west, and then the part that does come south. Your question is well, that south, there's already a future flood plain, flood plain there. That's yeah, existing. there's a flood plain there, correct? And that's where the water is all directed to that flood plain. There's a, a big you know track that's reserved for that flood plain and for the water to go there from that part of the development. But once that water goes there, if I'm correct, it would build it up and then run right across our area into the creek well we're not sure that it's going to be designed to build up or if it's just designed to run off is that right tim yeah i'm not sure if i understand the, the question but but yeah i mean typically yeah we take the water to a point yeah. detain it and, and then release it from that point but you weren't into putting the a containment area in there the way i understood by the sheets that they it's not your study, but the state made a study on it that you didn't need a containment area. Is that correct? Uh, that I don't know. I think the engineer we talked to the other day said there would not be a containment area. It didn't have to be by your sheet. But with all this, uh, the storm sewers dumping in that one spot, I'd be glad to show you photos of that area right there with just the normal rains. And it, it comes all the way up to there with, with the rains that we've had past. And actually, a little more water, what it's going to do is going to, I have a well down there on the other side of the creek, and the water come the last time come up within this far of the well. And I'm concerned with well, pushing a, probably another 40 acres of water into that one corner. It's really going to come up then. So that, that was my only concern is just 
on that part. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Did you have something for us real quick? Um, uh, back to the buffer. Uh -huh. uh, there is going to be a buffer required between the R3 district and the R1. So even though there may not, I mean, we're not requiring a buffer on the single, back of the single family homes to the other single family homes. I mean, that's not what's in our code. But right. he will have to buffer those um, quads from the other single family homes around them with uh, one tree per 50 linear feet, one shrub per 10 linear feet, and at least eight foot perimeter depth of the buffer. Thank you. I don't think we have anything else that, at yeah, this point. Working oh, on the right away. They're still working on the right away piece. Go ahead. Yeah, it looks like there's a um, Sorry, uh, it looks like on the that a plot that the, uh, they're going to be dedicating about 60 feet of right away on the gardener side. So he'll have this. The, he'll be dedicating that right away for okay. future road expansion. Okay, great. That answered that answered the it's a lot of right, away. right away question. I think it was. Well, that really just add that, from, oh. that actually Center meets our road. arterial standard. So that's we asked for 60 feet so that. In the future, when it gets wide into four lanes or whatever, then we have enough right away. So, and that's our, our standard would be 60 foot each side. Okay. And then his landscaping would be, of course, beyond that. So hopefully the county won't be anywhere near yeah. his landscaping. But it's a very good point. We're glad they brought it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, I think that was the last outstanding question. Or No, I no Brad had another one. Um, kind of going back to the one that I tabled earlier. Uh, if the water study does find that they need detention or retention in areas that aren't currently shown and it affects the layout of the lots, is that a concern for us approving the preliminary and or final plats? Uh, they would come back with a revised preliminary plat and then a revised final plat if they had to make those lot adjustments. Okay, and is there, is that I guess is that a requirement of the development plan that they finish that study and implement those things or there is no development plan since this is not a plan district so that's why we have a rezoning a plenary plat and final so there's no development plan so we would just be going with the plat okay so i guess my question now is why don't we have that answer before the final plat isn't that something we require and need? It was my understanding from uh, engineering that they will look at those along with the um, construction plans for the roadways uh, because that's how stormwater is managed, right? So when, when they look at that construction plans, they'll be looking at that. And then we look at it again for each lot as those lots are developed with the grading of each lot. Well, I would just add that there, there actually is a, a tract uh, showing detention on it, um, which according to, to what we've seen with our new study, they wouldn't be using it, but there, there actually is a tract at the south east corner set aside for detention if it's needed. Okay. I guess If this is a normal process, that's fine. It just concerns me that we would approve something with the possibility of it changing in a week or two when the report's done. Um, I guess my next, I had one more question. Um, is there not a requirement or was there any discussion of providing uh, sidewalk along South Garden Road, that frontage. I know it wouldn't really go anywhere right now, but I would envision that eventually they'll, they would connect it to the elementary and possibly beyond once that road's widened and, and develop more. Uh, our standards have certain requirements for sidewalks along different types of roads, but I didn't look that specific one up before tonight. 
uh, generally on arterials, we don't build the sidewalks until the road is built. Um, it, it's just the expense and having to do it when you still have open ditches, it makes it difficult. And then so it, it'd be difficult to build it and then have it in place so that you, know, you wouldn't be tearing it out Sorry. again when you, build, when you built the arterial. Okay. And, and that makes sense to me to an extent, except that it's already an arterial without plans for expanding it set in stone. So if we're building a brand new road, I would understand that, but is there, I mean, I, I guess just trying to, what do our standards usually require for if this wasn't, if this was at a different part of Center Street? One of the things that I have some concern about just holistically as our commission is that we we remember to think that, yeah, right now that's a ways out there and it's, you know, surrounded by openness, but 10, 20 years from now it'll be surrounded by development. And if we don't put the infrastructure and the plans in place now, it will affect what it looks like in 10, 15, 20 years. And so that's why I, one of the things I try to keep in my mind as we review these, as, as far as everything from building types and exteriors and all kinds of fun stuff. But I think it's a sound concern. The one thing I'll point out with this plan, and it is in phase one, is track. I can't. I think it's a D that is on one of the corners to provide access to the elementary school that through the d the neighborhood itself. Um, but you're right. But we, I, I, the other piece that we we have to, to fight through is is where we already have that set up. And if you think about um, some of the other like 167th Street where they have access, there's there's no sidewalks along a great part of those, and it's the berms and the landscaping. So then where's the precedent at, and when do you change that, and when codes don't dictate it? So. That's the hard thing. It's a, it's a great point. It's just how do we say now's the time we have to do it, and what means do we have to do so? And I don't know that we have any means to do so as a commission from the code itself. It, it, well, and that was my question: was what does the code require for sidewalks along arterial roads? And the one thing that just popped into my mind was over off of Moonlight, um, those I don't remember if it was R three. Um, duplexes, fourplexes, mm -hmm. townhouses that we reviewed a year or two ago. Uh, we made them put a sidewalk along the moonlight, which would be very similar to this other than it may not be a ditch at that point. It may be a... There, there was a... Forgive me. Uh, that particular aspect is a very good point, sir, that you bring up. Uh, the uh, 183rd and moonlight intersection uh, when the Willow Springs original concept was built, which this final piece was being done along White and Moonlight and 183rd now, the, uh, there was a 10-foot wide trail proposed for Willow Springs on the what would be the north side of 183rd. Willow Chase is the new one, but Willow Springs was the original. Uh, that was not constructed because of the and it says in the planning commission minutes until such time as the road is improved and that part is just now being done this many years later so it is it is a timing issue much like tim said earlier sometimes you you plan for that but our arterial requirements when we build the road takes into account the fact that sidewalks are needed and so it's that point in time to which the sidewalks are designated to where they'd be and how wide they'll be so it's when the road construction takes place. We do try and take it into account in the planning process when we talk about getting enough road right of way to make sure that the right of way is there to do that at a later point in time. And that's why we're getting a 60 foot right of way at this point in time, because that is their half of that 120 foot total that we look for when we build a future arterial roadway. Okay. Does that help? I would just address your question of what kind of sidewalk would be required and that's all dependent on what kind of arterial street we call that because we have four different 
types of arterial streets. And so some of them have five foot sidewalks and some of them have more. And we're just in the process of trying to designate roads as certain types so that we can, you know, nail that down in the future. And, and typically we would have the developer put that in right now. You're right. And that's a very, very good concern. And I think that just being our first development across I-35 and not having all our, you know, detailed plans in place, we're just kind of hedging on that for now. But. Okay. Yeah, just one to. other comment. Michelle reminded me. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> the, um, the excise tax is intended to go for arterials, so even though we're not saying, okay, you're going to build a sidewalk with this project, they're putting money towards the construction of that future sidewalk and the whole arterial network. That's a good point. Yep, thanks. Anything else staff would like to add? There's no other questions from the commissioners. Um, I'd continue uh, with the entertainment of a motion on um, the uh, preliminary plat. At review of case PP 1707, a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farms parcel IDs, oh geez, as printed on page 12 of the Planning Commission materials, located on the south side of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road. A preliminary plat dated November 15th, 2017, and staff report dated November 20, 2017. The Planning Commission approves the application after finding all applicable requirements have been met with the following condition that firms be placed on the south side of the property as allowed by water lines. Water drainage. As allowed by the drainage study. Okay. As allowed by the drainage study and we want that to go with the prelim plot. That this is fine with the, you guys are fine with the motion that we're making with a potential stipulation on the preliminary plot to add berms. I don't know where we can on the preliminary plan. It I doesn't think that have would, landscaping stipulations. Yeah, I think that would need to come so with the uh, point would we do that? the final because we've got one more. Final. Yeah, we've got one more uh, item to review yet. Of course, um, okay. would, but we're but one that's one only that part, part of but, yeah. one phase. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if we're at that part yet for the the south side of the. Yeah, that would be your third phase, not okay. first phase. Okay, yeah, and we're so only I'll looking at the first that phase. Then. Okay, so yeah, removing that condition. Okay, I think that's that's a good, that would be the correct um, way to proceed. Okay. All Se right. Second. Okay, great. All right, so we have a motion made by Brady and a, a second by Robert that after review of case PP-17-07, a preliminary plat for Tuscan Farms with parcel IDs as noted on page 12 of the staff report located uh, south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road, a preliminary plat dated November 15, 2017, and staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission approves the, approves the application after finding all applicable requirements have been met. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. And now we'll take a look at um, Item 2C then, which is the uh, FP-17-07, consider a final plat for Tuscan Farms contains 70 single family lots and it looks like this is the, the, the phase the phase one. It's where it looks like the northern edge, but staff will uh, give us a presentation. We can ask questions. Thank you, Madam, Com uh, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Cricks, planner of the City of Gardner. And uh, this uh, evening we'll be discussing Tuscan Farms first plot, which is a final plot uh, for Tuscan Farms, which is the first phase of the development located south of Nike Elementary and uh, along South Gardner Road. So the graphic in front of you is going to show you which of those lots are going to be impacted by uh, this uh, first plot, which are outlined in blue. You'll notice only five of the six parcels will be impacted by this first plot. So in front of you is um, showing what that uh, what the area of the first plat is. 
The plat is for 70 single family lots um, along the uh, north property line, which is adjacent to Nike Elementary and the uh, vacant land there along the north. Um, within this uh, plat, uh, there are five tracts of land uh, proposed. Uh, four of them are to be owned and maintained by the Homes Association, which include the landscape tracks there um, along uh, South Gardner Road, which the developer alluded to uh, in an earlier um, case. Uh, the community amenity there at Tract uh, C, which is on this plot, kind of along that south there. Um, and um, uh, the pedestrian access of Track D from the development to Nike Elementary. Now included with this plat, um, and as we discussed with the last case, that there's uh, noted to be land dedicated to the city of Gardner for parks and rec space. A small portion um, of that land will be dedicated at this time with this plat, which is highlighted in green on your graphic there up at the uh, very northwest corner there. So this is um, a street tree plan provided by the applicant uh, for the development. Um, so you'll notice there that uh, the applicant has provided for uh, trees uh, that uh, comply with the uh, code. Um, he's provided site triangles on there to show that uh, we don't have any trees located within those site triangles. Um, uh, now, um, track, C, uh, track C is actually um, proposed to be zoned R3, and because we have as uh, R3 zoning adjacent to R1 zoning, they are required to uh, put buffer requirements um, between the two zoning uh, designations which the applicant has provided. Uh, within this uh, first phase, the applicant has provided approximately 115 trees. And it was noted by staff that um, the applicant uh, did, um, uh, uh, need to review the requirement and meet the requirements for tree diversity. So the uh, section 17-08.030 of the Gardner Municipal Code refers to that there are three requirements necessary for tree diversity for this amount or this quantity of trees. And they have to provide at least two genus and at least five species of trees and no more than 20% of any uh, one species provided on the plan. It was noted by staff that the applicant has provided 29% of the autumn blaze maples and 28% autumn gold ginkgos, 14.7% uh, of red buds, 11% honey locusts, and 16% of the patriot elms. Um, in order for the tree diversity to comply with the ordinance, reductions in the autumn blaze maple and the autumn gold ginkgos will be uh, required. And uh, the applicant can actually just offset that by reducing the numbers of those trees and maybe increasing the number of another uh, tree species that he's already provided on the plan. And staff has stipulated um, that this uh, requirement um, should be met. Uh, staff is recommending the Planning Commission approve uh, the final plat, FP1707 for Tuscan Farms first plat uh, with the parcel IDs noted on the screen, located south of Nike Elementary along South Gardner Road to the governing body with the following conditions. But the preliminary plat, which is PP1707, uh, to be approved prior to the release of the final plat uh, for recording. Uh, prior to the recording of the final plat, an excise tax in the amount of 199561 shall be paid to the city. Construction plans for any utilities, infrastructure, or public facilities shall meet. All technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of the plat for recording. And per the Garden, Gardner Municipal Code 17.08.030C, the applicant shall revise the street tree plan to show no more than 20% of overall quantity of trees um, shall be one tree species prior to the release of the plat for recording and recommends the governing body accept dedication of right-of-way and easements. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. I don't know if the applicant has anything they'd like to add um, with the, the final plat. Discussion. I really don't. Uh, I take questions. I really don't. I think we've already talked okay. about it. Talked about it all. Yeah. Just thought I'd give you an opportunity if there's anything else you wanted to comment on. Okay. Commissioners, questions, comments on um, the um, final plat. I have one for for staff. Okay. And, and it, it 
it's not necessarily specific to this one other than the question applies to this one. I've seen it on other ones. Is the official plat that gets to be submitted, is the surveyor seal signed and dated? Or are we receiving those without signatures and dates on the professional seals? No, the plat that gets recorded is signed and sealed um, by the um, by the surveyor, by the engineer. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because we usually or often see them without signatures and that doesn't mean anything. Um, so, okay, that's all I had. Okay. We don't have other questions or comments. I'll entertain a motion on this item. After review of FP-17-07, a final plat for Tuscan Farms, first plat, parcel IDs, <coughs> CF221502-3001, CF221502-2013, CF221502-3011, 2F221502-4009, and 2F221502-4007, located south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road. The final plat dated November 15, 2017, and staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission recommends approval uh, of the application to the governing body provided the following conditions are met. Condition 1, preliminary plat PP-17-07 shall be approved prior to release of the final plat FP-17-07 for recording. Two, prior to recording of the final plat next size tax in the amount of $199,561.28 shall be paid to the city. Three, the construction plan for any utilities infrastructure or public facility shall meet all technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of the plat for recording. And four, per Garden Municipal 17.08.030C, the applicant shall revise the street tree plan to show no more than 20% of overall quantity of trees shall be any one tree species prior to release of the plat for recording and recommends the governing body accept dedication of right of way and easements. Second. We have a motion made by Austin with a second by Freeman that after review of FP-17-07, a final plat for Tuscan Farms, first plat, parcel ID CF221502-3001, CF221502-2013, CF221502-3011, two F221502-4009, and 2F221502-4007, located south of Nike Elementary School along South Gardner Road, a final plat dated November 15th, 2017, and staff report dated November 28, 2017. The Planning Commission recommends approval of the application to the governing body provided the following conditions are met, items one through four, as stated in the page five of the staff report and recommends the governing body accept dedication of right-of-way and easements. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Thank you guys very much. That was a lot of good discussion on item two. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of text amendments. Let's start with item 3A, TA-17-03. Hold a public hearing and consider a proposed text amendment to the Gardner Land Development Code, Section 17.10, Sign Standards Regarding Wall Signs in Residential Districts. We have a presentation this evening before we open the public hearing. Good evening, Commissioners. Yes, we do. Kelly Drake, Chief Great. Planner. Kelly Drake Woodward, sorry. It's been a long night. <laughs> All right, um, so you may remember that this um, issue first came up from code compliance activities pertaining to this sign that you see in the picture, which is a large permanent wall sign in a residential district. And so uh, at your <coughs> September 26th uh, meeting that was discussed and 
staff proposed that the planning commission initiate a potential test text amendment so that staff could research the issue look at regulations in other jurisdictions and consider whether a wall uh, amendment of wall sign standards was advisable um, considering that public input and the need to maintain regulations that are content neutral and also thinking about neighborhood character so you did that um, initiated the text amendments I'm going to remind you of the content neutrality uh, standard that we used when drafting the Gardner Land Development Code and that was to reduce our legal risk associated with enforcement based on the Supreme Court case Reed versus Town of Gilbert and in that case thus they established that content based regulation is unconstitutional and invalid unless that government regulation can pass the strict scrutiny test and is nearly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest. So I, I hopefully put enough explanation of that in your staff report. Um, I, and if we can re revisit that with our attorney here if we need to, but we still have that goal of reducing risk for the city. So uh, the pertinent issues per the public comment are listed here. I'm going to go through them uh, one by one. Starting with, should Gardner differentiate art content from other content and exempt art content? And if so, what is art? Um, so first of all, here's our current definition of sign and also our current definition of wall sign. And the underlying words are what staff use to make a determination that this object in particular is a sign uh, per our code and was subject to our sign regulations, which you might remember it did not meet because it's first of all a permanent wall sign which is not allowed and uh, even as a temporary sign it would be too large. Okay, so uh, we did check with the attorney, um, but you know before we made that determination, and they were all in agreement with our determination. So the difficulty in attempting to define and then exempt art or decoration from that regulation is that um, it's really subjective. Those terms when I start looking at them, and so we kind of prefer to just define signs and then if that decorative feature or that thing that's created doesn't meet the sign definition then it, that regulation just wouldn't apply. Um, so I think it's our attorney's opinion that we really don't regulate art or decoration currently anyway. And then trying to figure out whether we could exempt a sign that has writing on it when we don't, you know, we can't exempt some writing and not other writing, you know, we can't get into that content. So there's really not a very good content neutral way for us to feasibly exempt that sign from regulation. We can come up with anything there. The next question that was asked, um, and this pertains to temporary signs, is if we can have two signs, eight square feet each, why can't we have one sign 16 square feet? And this all has to do with, you know, sign size and community aesthetics and neighborhood character. This is what would typically, what would be allowed on a typical 70 foot wide residential lot in our code at this time. Um, so Gardner is really the only jurisdiction that I looked at the sign regulations for that specifically does address temporary wall signs for single family and duplex uses. Typically, um, wall signs are, are not you know, addressed for uh, single family and duplex uses in, the, in these codes. So uh, this is in addition to the allowances that we also have for temporary freestanding signs. And then we do allow some permanent wall signs 
um, the small ones, uh, two square feet or less. And other jurisdictions do as well. Olathe allows one square foot. Overland Park, one to four. Lawrence, two to four. And Lenexa, one to six. And it depends on the content. So they're still kind of stuck in the content-based regulation thing. But those are the ranges. Um, so typically, jurisdictions allow for permanent freestanding signs only for subdivision entrances, multifamily uses, institutions, things like that, but not for single family or duplex uses. So um, I think we allow ample opportunity for communications is the point of this. And I think our sign allocations are in line with what you'll see in most other communities. So the staff finding on this issue is that based on our limited research that's reflected in Table 2, it supports the conclusion that numerous or large signage is generally not consistent with the character of low-density residential areas. Per sign maximums are generally implemented to ensure that any one sign is of appropriate scale for residential neighborhoods, which would generally be unobtrusive for homes on individual lots. And combining two such signs would not support the goals of our uh, sign standards to um, encourage the appropriate scale design and placement of signs for them to be appropriately conspicuous, visible, and legible. These are all things we can discuss further. Um, and the last issue was creating that balance between constitutional freedom of expression and community aesthetic concerns, which have been shown to be a substantial government interest as far as judicial review. And staff's finding is basically based on the information that was pre presented. Again, um, sign area allocations for wall signs in residential districts are consistent with other jurisdictions and pro provide that appropriate balance between constitutional freedom of expression and community aesthetic concerns. So therefore, staff is not recommending any amendments for area allocations for wall signs in residential district. <coughs> and it, this is where um, I did uh, make a recommendation is that maybe we fine tune the sign definition. I wanted to perhaps simplify it. Kind of drives me crazy currently. The device, word device is in there twice. It's just a little thing, but um, I was worried that the last sentence of the current definition, which is in strike through red up above there, uh, was could be content based because you actually have to read that object to tell if it talks about any of those things. I don't know that that's a real concern and, and um, our city attorney can address that if you'd like. Um, so the recommended definition below is what's in your staff report. Uh, the Basically it changes it to, to what is defined as communication, which in the dictionary definition is usually communicating something that communicates information um, and using graphic elements. So I, I looked up all those terms in the dictionary since it's not my intent to define all those terms in our code. And uh, this is what I settled upon. Um, today we're, we're discussing these definitions and uh, I just always call you Chuck. I'm sorry, but <laughs> Chuck uh, you know, we had some suggestions. If we do um, want to keep with the current definition, uh, we could change that one word to communication instead of announcement and advertisement because I didn't want to get into arguing about whether someone intends to announce or intends to advertise or if it's just in the nature of that. but. Um, so that's an option, or um, he suggested that removing the part in strike through there in the revised recommended definition that says that is affixed to painted or represented directly or indirectly upon a building or other outdoor surface. 
um, he was worried, I think, that that would not be inclusive of things on posts. Or fit. It wasn't clear what that was, and we, and we determined we really don't need that anyway because the definitions for wall signs and freestanding signs actually talk about where those signs are. So the subtype definitions deal with that anyway. So we can jump back and forth on those definitions depending on what you want to do. Okay. The one comment I would have with regard to the uh, the definitions, the language which directs attention to an object, product, place, activity, person, institution, organization, or business, are generally those are well used standard language that's derived from court cases, recommended by the uh, IMLA, International Municipal Lawyers Association, as, and they're derived from examples in case law of acceptable language. Uh, we can change, I, I, I know uh, uh, Ms. Woodward's concern and her which my mother would love, um, hatred of use of the same word twice in a definition or the use of a definition of, of the word itself within the definition. Um, while our land development code, municipal code generally uses common ordinary definitions and so the first thought is, hey, let's look what the what Webster says the definition is. The terms contained within these definitions are often legal terms of art. There have been multiple cases about them. And so it is difficult and one must act with care in changing them. That would be my only concern um, with regard to changing it. My initial concern with regard to that is affixed to, painted, or represented directly or indirectly upon a building or outdoor surface, I, I have concluded, I, and I told, this is my thing, I told uh, Kelly that, that, that I had a concern about that not addressing freestanding signs, uh, but I think that, that that is addressed by other outdoor surface, and, and I was overcautious with regard to that. Uh, so the, the current definition covers um, the issue. You could lose the terms an advertisement or announcement, replace them with name, identification, description, display, or illustration, um, which would, would make it broader. Um, you do not have to have the terms um, advertisement or an announcement, uh, but I would suggest designed or intended direct attention to the face of, and then that list of things. I don't know if that's clear as mud or if we're all. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm following a little bit. I think we'll, we definitely want to ha probably have some conversation. Um, knowing this is a public hearing, let's go through the formality of opening the, uh, the public hearing. Um, if anyone wishes to speak on this item, please come forward. State your name and address for the public record and be heard. Hold up, Rick. <laughs> I don't believe we're going to have anybody um, wishing to speak this evening, so... I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion to close the public hearing made by Brady with a second by Austin. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. The public hearing is now closed. Okay. All right. Questions, I, I, I just comments. want to point out one yeah, more I thing can, before the discussion. Yeah, discuss. Is um, whatever... <laughs> definition you agree on if you do decide to change the definition I would recommend that you include these findings along with your change 
or some findings along with your reasoning. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Either way, I guess where I'm at, um, I had a bunch of notes and questions and thoughts and ideas, but I think it all boils down to I tend to agree with getting rid of the an advertisement or announcement unless that's our intended, unless that's our intent, and if that is our intent, then I would tend to question the application of this other case because I don't understand what it's announcing or advertising but uh, <coughs> so Brad would you be comfortable because there's there's a couple of chunks in here when I'm looking at the recommended motion I'm going to come back around to Heath as well because it, it, it just kind of dawned on me we got a couple of things going on here so really what we're looking at to change is is according to, to staff's recommendation after planning commission discussion um, would would you be comfortable? Are you kind of feeling like you um, would agree with staff's recommendation of the the revised recommended definition, kind of the, the second portion below that's showing on the screen? And secondly, are you then okay with, um, or do you have any questions or thoughts on, because um, we want to base following findings, right? And staff did a really good job at, of putting together following findings that we don't need to change anything else. So it's kind of like a, a several folded motion um, that we want we need to entertain tonight. So um, regarding the sign definition, Brad, are are you um, what's what's your thoughts on what we're seeing here on the screen after discussion questions? You know, are you leaning towards agreeing with the revised recommended definition that's showing on the screen with some strikeout? Or are you um, okay with the recommended motion in red as printed in the staff report or something totally different? Just trying well, to kind of get, I, yeah, get no, a quick feeling from each of the commissioners. Uh, my initial thought was the revised recommended definition sounds great. The more I think about it, and, and one, of the, the question, one of the issues that I had previously, and I didn't know how to get around it, whether we use the word communication or the text as currently in the definition is it, everything, almost everything, is intended to communicate something. All artwork is developed generally with, you know, that's why they have names and stuff. Um, that being a non-art person, that's my technical terms. Um, but so so now after our discussion. I, I'm starting to question whether, which is a better approach? Do we use communication or do, do we use the, um, draws attention to an object, product, place, activity, person, institution, organization, or business, um, which is more specific than communication in general. Uh, I think I can probably go either way on the issue. I don't know what the right answer is. From uh, the legal, I, uh, go ahead. I thought you were done. No, go ahead. I apologize. Um, I will tell you that that which directs attention to an object, product, place, activity, person, institution, organization, or business is the more is the legally vetted term. Communication is shorter. It is more concise is not the legally vetted term. Cannot tell you that there are cases out there saying communication is fine. That other language is. After the Reed case, legal commentators, IMLA's proposed, would be to include the term the sign face amongst that list of things which directs attention to the sign face or an object, product, place, activity, person, institution, organization, or business. Okay, 
So I guess I'm, yeah. I, I would say, and I hate to, I don't know, I, I appreciate the discussion. I think all the different aspects and avenues have been helpful to me. Um, based on all the discussion, I would probably do the following. And I can make it as a motion if you want, but I figure other people have things to yeah, say first. Yeah, I want to make sure we, we get around. But I was just kind of getting your, you know, getting your thoughts out there as far as. Um, right. Yeah. So I would take our current definition. Mm -hmm. I would strike the second device. I would add directing attention to after uh, or which is in the nature of. I would strike an advertisement or announcement which directs attention to, and I would add the sign face prior to an object. Okay, so you're, kind of seems you like you're, that. yeah, you're kind it's of. It's a like, hybrid between both approaches. Right, kind of with Heath on the initial, you know, hey, I think we're, we've, we've got a, a good definition going. Sounds like you're kind of in the same vein, a little bit of some modification, and, um, I, I, sticking with you know staff's recommendation of no additional changes to the other provisions as far as sign standards it sounds like we've got some good findings of fact um, he thought I'll just ask you that was part of the, the other question I didn't really get to ask you um, were you comfortable with the staff findings of fact um. I, I, I stick. I don't. I don't think it's broke. I don't think we need to try and fix okay, it. So that's that that really is where I stick on okay. it. I think it. I think it worked and was applied correctly. Okay. So. okay. I'm good with that. Um, Brad, you kind of fill in the same way with Heath. You know, it's it's working as designed. Maybe a few minor changes as you've recommended. Anything else you want to add? What's your, uh, I would change the current definition. I agree with Heath. I think it it was one incident that has prompted this, and um, the sign codes had just been revamped basically before I got back on planning commission. I'm fine with the current definition <clears throat> and and comfortable with I'm kind of, yeah, with the other the fact findings, and, yes. Okay, all right, Tim. It's me. It doesn't matter what definition you use because all for interpretation, and then the enforcement piece. You know, and that, that's the hard part on, on the city's part. Uh, I just want to make sure, because this was returned to us from the city council, correct? Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure we can wrap this thing up today so then come back to us again. So if we go with a recommendation that's spread right here, our staff report, is that going to suffice yes. the city council? I know that's hard to predict. <laughs> I wasn't at the city council meeting that's, here and they're yeah. through their return back to us. So but we don't have a lot of citizens in the audience tonight to come talk about it. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I'm just gauging on public. I can't. But. I can't. Obviously, I can't answer that question. I would say in terms of your current uh, definition, although I understand uh, Ms. Wilbur's concerns with regard to uh, um, changing it, I think the current the current definition is legal. You can update it slightly by changing advertisement or announcement to name, identification, description, or display. Um, but I think that you're 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 okay. Okay. Appreciate that that in, input. Um. Does that help, Tim? Any other yeah, questions? Yeah, I'll just kind of wait for the motion to <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> hear what we finally end up with. I, I think we're all kind the, of the, kind the, of one, the same I think the, the one thing that, that is important to note from the, and I, I, I that as we've gotten into the weeds on the language here, Mr. Woodward's presentation covered in detail. This initial question came up about a specific sign. Whether we pick the revi the current definition, the revised current definition, the revised recommended definition, or the IMLA's draft, which is only a draft, model definition, the same answer would apply 
to the particular sign right. display yep, or what have you. It's still in violation. It's in violation. Correct. The end. But if they would, but they could have it up temporarily. There is a provision permitting process yeah. for yeah. three months or whatever. I forget what it was. Yeah. If they made it the right size. If they made it smaller, cut it in half. Yeah. 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 Brad, make a motion. Yeah, we, we'll entertain a motion. This will be debated long enough, I think. I recommend that after review of the staff report dated November 28, 2017, the Planning Commission recommends that no action be taken on the definition of sign in Article 17.02.010 in the Gardner Lane Development Code. Second. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, the, the governing body didn't even ask you to d work on the sign definition, right? They wanted you to address wall signs in residential districts. So there's kind of two parts to the recommended motion that's in there now. So if you don't think there should be a, a change to the sign definition, you, you probably don't even have to mention that. But just report back to the city council that we do have, have to take away so we made earlier. We do have to address <laughs> the concerns they sent it back for for wall signs in residential district, which is the second part of the motion, which says, you know, take no action, etc. The part after the de definition it says with no recommended amendment to the provisions of blah, 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 pertaining to wall signs in residential districts based on the findings. And the findings are just in there so they know what your decision is based on. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. And you, you make whatever <laughs> recommendation you want or no, motion you want. Sure. So it's like no action on both because, yeah, I see what she's talking about. You see that too, Heath, where it's like we've got the definition and the sign and then the provisions to the sign standards. So it's like no action on both based on findings. Um, but I guess is kind of where I would go with it. Do we, since this was introduced as a text amendment, do we have to recommend denial of the text amendment? Is it going to go to the council either way? So we have to recommend denial of the text amendment as presented and have no recommended amendment for the rest down below there. Or is it no change? Well, you can make the, the motion. We could, you could vote against it. And that would be a signal to the city council. If we make a motion with specific findings, do those findings, by being clearly defined in such a manner, open it up to more interpretation for any party to take different actions on it mm -hmm. and challenge mm -hmm. what the findings are that our opinion was based upon? Do I need to mention that there's any findings at all and that there are no recommended amendment to the provisions in Article 17.10 signed standards? I would recommend that you make a finding that the current standards support the goals contained within Chapter 17 signed standards as sta either as stated or list them. Okay. Upon review of that, that you believe that those goals are appropriate make the finding that they're appropriate and the current definitions and code sections support and advance those goals and community standards. Okay, I withdraw my initial motion. So we'll pull that off of the table. Okay, all right. And now we will Wait for someone to do something besides me. <laughs> I mean, like that answer. They like dinner. That's best. Um, no, so I, I, you know what? I don't. I, I, yeah, I can take a shot at it. Let's do that. <laughs> I move that the planning commission, after review of the staff report dated November 28, 2017, re recommend that the governing body deny text amendment. 17-03 to amend the definition of a sign in Article 
definitions of the land develop, Gardner Land Development Code. And with no recommended amendment to the provisions in Article 17.10 sign standards pertaining to wall signs in residential districts based on the following findings. Uh, all those, one, all those sign provisions of the Gardner Land Development Code are designed to regulate signs in a content <coughs> neutral manner, thus minimizing the city's legal risk. The current definition of sign. Uh, strike that. Strike item one. Uh, strike item one, strike item two. Um, so now the new item one. Gardner's current area allocations for wall signage are consistent with and typical of those of other jurisdictions for low density residential uses. And new item two, current standards support the following goals from chapter 17.10 signed standards. Goal one, preserve the unique character of the city is reflected in distinct areas and districts within the city by ensuring signs contribute to an appropriate sense of place. Goal two, enhance the visual quality of the community reflected in the visual priority of buildings, open spaces, streetscapes, and landscape. Goal 8, protect and enhance public and private investment in property by encouraging the design scale and placement of signs that are appropriately conspicuous, visible, and legible. And Goal 9, ensure that the constitutionally agreed or constitutionally guaranteed right of free speech is protected while allowing signs as a means of public communication. Second. Okay. All right. I think we can do this. All right. We have a motion <clears throat> made by Austin with a second by Freeman. Are we okay? Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to okay. do. I just want to double check with like, the legal like, counsel that we're... Okay, all right. Uh, the Planning Commission, um, after review of staff report dated November 28, 2017, recommends that the governing body deny TA-17-03 to amend the definition of sign in Article 17.02.010, definitions of the Gardner Land Development Code, with no recommended amendment to the provisions in Article 17.10 sign standards pertaining to wall signs in residential districts based on the following findings. Item number one, Gardner's current area allocations for wall signage are consistent with and typical of those of other jurisdictions for low density residential uses. Item number two, current standards support the Following goals of Chapter 17.10 Sign Standards, Goal 1, preserve the unique character of the city as reflected in distinct areas and districts within the city by ensuring signs contribute to an appropriate sense of place. Goal 2, enhance the visual quality of the community reflected in the visual priority of buildings, open spaces, streetscapes, and landscape. Goal 8, protect and enhance public and private investment in property by encouraging the design, scale, and placement of signs that are appropriately, appropriately conspicuous, visible, and legible. And goal nine, ensure that the constitutionally guaranteed right of free speech is protected while allowing signs as a mean of public communication. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Okay, we've got 30 minutes left. We have one more item. Item 3B, another text amendment. TA-17-04, <clears throat> hold a public hearing and consider a proposed text amendment to the Gardner Land Development Code, six, section 17.07 building standards regarding building design and performance standards for the general industrial building type. Which we will have a staff presentation on that, but um, before we do, you guys, great job on the last one. Good discussion, um, good participation. and. Thank you um, for the input. Certainly. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, 3B. Hang on. There we go. No, I can't get
much time to have. I spent too much time here. While they bring that up, we'll just get started. How about that? Okay, so this uh, amendment was generated by inquiries for future industrial freight and distribution uses involving large warehouse facilities and developers' concerns with some of the de design and performance standards. So at the September 26th meeting, the Planning Commission initiated a potential text amendment. Um, and the intent of that was to research the building and design requirements of adjacent jurisdictions and typical building designs with the intent to provide additional flexibility without requiring code deviations. This uh, talks about our current deviation process that would be available, neither of which um, are really uh, well they're they both add extra steps to the process plan districts are not intended to be used this way there is a risk of inconsistency in decisions made by different decision makers and also leads to developer uncertainty and frustration so we are trying to make it more clear within the standards so they you know what they have to follow and if they follow them they should get approved that's the intent so this is to help you uh, understand what our current standards are, and this is just the design and performance standards for the one building type that we're talking about. So currently, transparency parency can be located at any height or location on the facade, but they do have to have 30% minimum on all street-facing facades, not just the one, but all, and they uh, do not have to provide direct views into the building necessarily because they're not required ground floor windows. Um, but just to point out that these uses frequently are surrounded by at least two streets and commonly there's loading doors on some of the street facing facades with limited the opportunity for windows. And as far as the primary entrance feature, uh, one such feature is required only on the street frontage. Frontage is determined in relationship to the front lot line. Um, so it's generally the side where they're addressed from or they're clearly, clearly oriented to, but basically that's one side, one primary entrance feature required per building. And then we have all these other uh, standards, which are really mostly guidelines about massing and horizontal and vertical articulation and, and ornamentation. And we'll talk more about that. Um, flexibility is built in with the use of the word should, but it also doesn't, it, it's kind of wishy-washy when you want to try to require something. So, here are some illustrations of some pictures I took over in Riverside when I was up there. Um, I was trying to find a way to uh, show you what I was talking about or what we're, we're concerned about here. Uh, the top building is mostly unbroken by any offsets or in the wall plane or the roof line. It does have some attached projections. Um, some higher quality materials and transparency, asymmetrical on some portions of the building. Um, but there are still a lot of remaining surfaces with no visual relief um, from a flat blank surface. The middle building is similarly one unbroken wall plane except for some attached projections and they're achieving ornamentation through some ground floor windows, color changes, and shadow lines. And uh, the bottom one does have a couple changes in roof height, you'll see, um, but no significant trim or depth change uh, as a transition between those materials. And visual relief is mainly through color texture changes. And so there are still uh, blank unrelieved surfaces on the building. So these are um, just talking about structural <clears throat> massing solutions. That's when you actually um, have projections and recesses in the building. Uh, this is an example of uh, horizontal 
structural or horizontal articulation. These portions of the building um, actually bump out by a significant amount. Um, and then that one bumps out even further. So note these um, projections do run the entire height of the building. Uh, so there's um, minimal depth changes there on the right side of the building. There is a little bit of depth change between those color changes. Um, but it wouldn't meet our current suggested articulation requirements, which is a one foot depth for that offset. So they, those would be more, more like ornamental architectural details. Then we have uh, vertical structural uh, massing solutions. As you see, the roof line changes up there. Uh, so most of the time when codes talk about vertical articulation, that is what they're talking about, changes in, in roof height. Um, so sometimes they're combined with changes in depth as well. Really, our requirements are actually our guidelines now. Well, I guess that one is the only one that's a requirement. Talks about vertically framing different structural components. So it's not like a structural component. We don't really have a vertical articulation requirement. And these are some examples of ornamental, basically ornamental ways to break up the mass. So this building is just about color changes with, with those shadow lines or expression <clears throat> lines framing those color changes. Uh, but it, it really adds a lot of interest to the building. In our code right now, um, horizontal articulation is really just expressed as differentiating the base, the body, and the top of the building. And our vertical articulation, um, as I just suggested, was, is just basically about the structural changes between materials and colors. But if you're just looking at buildings, you do see how this breaks up visually the building by just having the different colors and the different roof uh, lines and the different depths on the building. Another example, this one has, is pretty flat, but it does have uh, different roof heights that go along with it. This one combines both or all, everything. <laughs> different kinds of ornamentation and changes. Other ways to do uh, this are through transparency and a lot of times they say well we, we can't have that on our buildings and maybe they can't it might be not be practical but here are some examples of some that do utilize it. This one's mostly at the top and at the primary entrance feature. Um, this one has got a little strip of windows there that's vertical and then mostly just at the corners, they have windows. So we've got a lot of windows. Primary interest trends feature um, examples. This one doesn't have as much uh, transparency as this one. But they're, they're all pretty much have projections and, and rises in the rough lines and then uh, increase in detail. This one's got everything going on too, plus some nice trees, you might know. This one, uh, I wanted you to think about this. I remember I was talking about how some of those depth changes go all the way to the top of the roof line. The, these stop short. And um, my question to you is, um, just looking at that, you know, does this re repetition of those same features <coughs> along the facade draw your eye up, break up that mass, or does it just make it look longer as they proceed down the row? And uh, with, without that change in the roof line, does it really achieve, you know, what, what we're, in, we're wanting to do, which is to relate the building scale to ne nearby buildings <coughs> and not look contrived you know, put something on there that just looks contrived, but something that looks in scale with the building. And that's, that's probably a taste issue. So just um, highlighting what I found out in the other jurisdictions briefly, um, Edgerton mostly uh, 
has massing requirements that incorporate all the other things into them as options. So they say you have to use a minimum of three techniques to break up facades over 100 feet. 100 feet is like everybody's pretty much using that 100 foot as after that you got to do something about breaking it up. Um, but but so you can choose between three of these five things to achieve that. Lawrence is basically just completely guidelines. I'm not sure how they implement or enforce it or get it to happen, uh, but they recognize the importance of breaking up the facades vertically and horizontally with structural or design elements, not having continuous roof line, um, et cetera. And they do, you know, accept shade and shadow patterns as contributing to those goals. Um, and they do also articulate building entrances or, or suggest or encourage that. They don't uh, address transparency. Lee Summit um, also does not address transparency or primary entrance feature requirements. And they also include the ornamentation requirements in their massing strategies. So it's just kind of combining it all into one thing. They're the only ones that really talked about preferring pitched roofs but they did do also have standards like if you have flat roofs, they need to look like this. So I'm not sure what that's all about. Alenexa, uh, no transparency or primary feature, entry feature requirements. Um, but again, they have guidelines for breaking up the walls and varying textures, colors, lines. Uh, they do say that you need four-sided design. They have to have consistent architectural treatments on all sides of the building, so you don't have like a noticeable back side of the building. Olathe was probably the most involved regulations of any extensive and very specific for massing and ornamentation. Um, their definition of primary facade, you might think, okay, so that's just one facade. Well, no, it's basically the way they, they defined it, it's any facade that has any pavement adjacent to it at all and or has a primary entrance feature. So I don't know how you would not have a primary facade unless it's just grass behind it and no entrance. Um, so keep that in mind. So uh, they do require transparency and then focal points on the primary facade, which may or may not have an entry on it but it's similar to our primary entry feature requirement. Okay, findings were basically uh, to strengthen the massing and articulation requirements. Um, so uh, they're not just guidelines, but they have more options listed. And the suggestion that if there are no substantial changes in wall plane depth, then we probably need to have variations in roof height or roof form in order to compensate for that. Um, include the ornamentation standards as an option to help with that mass and articulation instead of just a suggestion that's like a lot of other jurisdictions do. Uh, create alternatives for transparency and reduce the requirement on non-frontage facades and to keep the front entry feature requirement. So this is how it shakes out. Um, I, I revised the first sentence, or the, I guess it's the first sentence in primary entry <coughs> feature because I was rereading it where it says on each side of the entrance. I think that just means on each side of the door, then you have to have that 25 feet of this transparency is I think we should leave that like it is. The only reason I scratched out entrance in the term primary entrance feature is because actually in the other section of the code is called a primary entry feature so I was trying to just keep it consistent. Uh, the, the massing we'd be adding that uh, statement that on all street facing facades that they will they shall break down components of the main mass longer than 100 feet by using at least one of the following options. Changes in the wall plane, um, extending the full height of the facade, and that we kept the one foot depth, at least one foot depth in the wall plane. 
uh, or varying roof lines or roof forms every 100 feet or less of facade length. They could do both. We can do just one. Transparency requirement was changed to not be on, not the 30% on all street facing facades, but just on the frontage facade. And then the other street facing facades would be 15% minimum required. I did suggest that we could allow up to 10% of that required transparency to be waived if they substitute higher quality materials on the on the face or that creates some other interest or they can use glass it's not transparent if that's an issue okay and then um, just putting in the, the statement that we do want them to do horizontal and vertical breaks as they're defined basically by all other jurisdictions not just the um, structural vertical breaks that we talk about but allowing them or encouraging them i guess actually requiring them to use the bands of color changes in material textures giving them a whole menu of things they can do to give some horizontal and vertical articulation to the building visually and then the the ornamentation standard being in there is just to address the frequency that they would do that um, ornamentation that's the current suggestion, but that's just making that a requirement. So the recommended motion is listed on three slides. So after review of the staff report and et cetera, that we would change just the design and performance standards section, which is 1707-040, uh, to read as follows. And uh, that's stuff I just went through. Okay, okay. that's all I got. Okay, cool. Very good, Kelly. Um, since this is a, a public hearing, we'll need to go through the motion of um, <clears throat> opening the public hearing. So any member of the public is invited to come forward and comment on this item. Please state your name and address for the public record and be heard. Seeing that we don't have anybody coming forward to... Um, to talk about this item, I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Sorry. Motion to close the public hearing made by Austin with a second by Brady. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. All in favor. Public hearing is now closed. Um, questions, comments, and I will just caution you guys. I don't know how much discussion you all might have. We've got 15 minutes allotted on our um, meeting time to where if we need to go past 10 o'clock we will have to make a motion um, and have that um, be uh, approved go through the process for us to continue past 10 so I'll give us a few minutes kind of see where we start um, going down the discussion and you know if we're coming up at 5 till 10 someone will need to make a motion to extend time so um, I'll just kind of start maybe down on my left with Heath and Tim do you guys have any, any comments, questions for, for staff um, on what we've been presented with this evening? As we look at transparency, one of the things I mentioned is, is our transparency standards seem to be a bit more stringent than any of our neighboring jurisdictions. Is that the assumption that I, I, I came to? That's correct. And we lessened those a bit, but are we still too stringent? Are we creating a negative or, uh, or competing against ourselves in that fashion when you know, every time we've had an exception come up, I think we've made it over my three years on the count. Every time they're coming up and I look at the entryway and, you know, 50 to 80 percent of 25 feet on each side of that. Is that too much? I mean, I, I would easily grant an exception to someone asking for that because I can even the examples we had in the pictures today. I don't know that any of those met that criteria and they were all appropriate from what we saw. So I, I think we've, we've overwritten some of these things. If we're going to look at it, maybe there's some of these pieces we just need to scrap. And, um, but I, 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 I don't know. I mean, we, where do we start and how do we go down that path is probably the, the question. But, you know, I look at these and, and then go back to the history of the ones I've just voted on. And we've made a lot of exceptions that were 100% appropriate in the right decision. So then are our regulations really out of whack for what the, the construction market and what the design standards are? for what we're seeing built around us. And 
you know, transparency was one where we stood out. I don't know if we stood out for the right reasons, and that's why we always make the exception to it. So that's kind of the, the transparency piece of this text amendment, Heath, that maybe um, it's even going a step further and having staff take a look at it again and possibly bring something different back to the Planning Commission? Yeah, and look and see what the impact, I mean. Just maybe more study? Well, and I don't. I mean, I hate to slight. I hate to say it in such a way that it's a slight that they didn't do the study necessary. Mm -hmm. And now that we have that study, right. maybe it's just actually changing what our transparency requirements are completely. And maybe that's not for them to decide for us to suggest and have them look and see what those impacts might be. But um, I don't know. I mean, you know, as we look at it, 15% on other street facing, and then. Um, we can waive up to 10% of that transparency, you know, those pieces, but are we asking too much in the primary entry? Or are we asking? I do like the massing um, that we see in front of us right now. I think okay. there's some definite value to that, but maybe some of these other pieces are more than we need to do. How about the articulation? Were you pretty good with that? Ornamentation? That really didn't change. Um, Oh, is that the yeah. horizontal? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I'm not strong either way on the articulation mm -hmm. side. Of it. I, I, you know, we sometimes I feel like maybe we overcoat, and uh, that might be the case where we are overcoating just a little bit. Okay. Okay. Anything else to add? No. Tim. Just simply, Kelly. I know you spent a lot of time on this. Thank you very much. You did a lot of research. Appreciate the pictures. Uh, I support the recommendation by staff. Okay. Tori? Um, wow. I, I kind of agree with Heath on this, that maybe we're making, making it more difficult, especially if we grant exceptions every time. And maybe that's why some of these other cities, you said, well, they didn't really say a sot. They, they have guidelines, but they didn't maybe spell it out exactly. I don't know. Maybe we are a little too strict on some of these. Um, I'd be okay with what we're changing, but I do think we make exceptions almost every single time. Okay. Brad? And not that I want to extend, but the chances of us resolving this within 10 minutes are probably low. So I move that we extend our meeting time till something, 10, 15. So we have a motion to extend the meeting time made by Austin. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Roberts. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, motion carries with all in favor. We will, um, meeting time extended to 1015 Central. All right, continue on, Brad. Okay. Uh, so along those same lines, I, I tend to agree. And when we were going through the land development code rewrite process, I didn't understand at that time the transparency requirements that we put in and I, I still don't necessarily understand them or, or the benefit of them to the extent that we use. I think um, for Commissioner Freeman's point, if you look at the transparency note and Edgerton, Lawrence, Lee, Summit, Lenexa all say none by them and Olathe it depends but maybe 20 percent and then we've got anywhere from 30 to 50 to 80. Um, I think that fairly clearly shows that we're out of whack with our surrounding cities. Um, not that we have to do what everybody else does, but I do agree on this type of building. I think the, the level of transparency needs to be reduced. I would say on our, well, I guess one question real quick. And I should know this, but I'm going to ask it anyway because somebody else might not know it. What's the difference between a street-facing facade and a street frontage? Uh, when we have to determine one side to be the frontage, and we do that by determining which side is the front lot line. Okay. And then the others are street-facing, but not the frontage. Because remember, we had those frontage standards. That we have to apply yeah. to the makes sense that's what i was thinking but i wanted to make sure that i was understanding that correctly 
Um, I, I would say from a transparency perspective, 30% minimum on the street frontage for this type of building uh, still seems high to me. Um, I do like the option of reducing the required percentage if they use some other feature to give the same type of effect. Uh, I, I like reducing 15% on the other facades. That seems uh, reasonable to me without doing math and figuring out what that really means. Uh, on the entry feature, I, I don't have any issue with us having or requiring entry features. Um, I, I think it's it helps anybody coming up to a building to know where the front door is. Um, I've tried to find the front door on buildings that don't have an entry feature and it's you feel stupid and walk around a lot. Um, but 50 to 80 percent transparency on either side of that entrance is astronomical in my opinion. Um, and I actually have two comments on that which I think 50 is way too much um, and I think, and I don't understand why we would limit it to 80. If they wanted a full glass wall, let them have a full glass wall. Um, but that's beyond this discussion um, and not really relevant. I, I, I do agree with going on to other topics. I do fully agree that we should, and we should not use the word should in our standards. Mm -hmm. um, standards are requirements and should is not a requirement and uh, so I agree with those changes to change those shoulds to shall I agree with the articulation I don't have any issue with that I agree with the ornamentation uh, the massing I agree with that with the one potential caveat of I don't and maybe it's just me and I don't really understand what it means but I don't like having the word generally after massing because to me that opens it up for being more of a recommendation than a requirement. Um, so if that has some other significance to it within the, the planning world, let me know. Um, maybe I'm missing something. But and I think I think that's a good point. And the reason it said massing generally is because it's current. That's the current heading from where it's a guideline. <laughs> so <laughs> probably should just say massing. Okay. I don't know what the correct percentages are. Uh, I know, I think I know, and correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, if, if we change anything within this wording, then we have to wait another month to see it again because of the public hearing issue. No, we can make changes to it. Okay. We'll disregard yeah, that I said that then. Do you have something, Michelle? Yes, please. Are you done? Yeah. Just to give you a little point of reference, um, the warehouse that you saw the beginning of the month for Midwest Commerce Center, um, they met all of these with, uh, with the current code except for the 30% transparency. Um, they did meet that primary entrance feature with the transparency on each side um, they did meet the um, the varying roof lines every hundred feet um, they did provide um, the architectural details as far as color changes and they had panel lines so it looked like there were different panels um, I think the only one they still wouldn't have met was the transparency. Um, I can't remember the exact number that they ended up with, but it was around, I think, 10% transparency on that west side. Um, but potentially they could have um, qualified for some of those details being waived for the substitution so just something to kind of think about something that you've seen recently right. and how that actually met a lot of those standards really the only one they didn't meet was a was the full-blown transparency on the side so good good comparison thank you for bringing that up michelle uh, it helps uh, to kind of 
Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I, I guess one clarification question, when we're talking about transparency here, we are talking about the full height of the building. It doesn't have to be within that, it was a two to 48 foot or something. Is that for other That's correct. Types? It can be anywhere between the floor so and the, the ceiling. The, the four to eight thing is for other building types? Well, no, it's, it's just that if the requirement specifically says it's for a ground floor requirement, it has to be between the two and eight feet. And this doesn't say anything about where our requirement for this building is just in general transparency. So it doesn't have to, to meet that. Okay, but I know that's been discussion on some other plans that we've reviewed of other building types. So I just wanted to make sure that didn't apply here. Um, oh, and just to clarify on the 30%, you do count whatever you have for the primary entrance feature, which would be on that facade. So, uh, you know, there, if they have to have that extra for the primary entrance feature, that 30% may not seem like a lot on just that one facade, but that's just the thought. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Still thoughts, Brad, or you wrapped up with your? Uh, I'm wrapped up, and unless you want me to, I mean, we need to throw out some numbers, but I well, don't know what they are. So. Yeah, and and I'm, I'm I don't know, I've, I've listened, listened to everyone's perspective, and especially after Michelle threw in the part about um, the current uh, pr proposed project, you know, that we, we saw earlier this month, and they met all of these with the exception of the transparency, but yet um, there's always that ability for the applicant to come before the planning commission and say, hey, we'd like a deviation, and then that could be considered. I guess I'm just as of the opinion, I, I like our standards. I think we're, it seems like we're one of the, the first cities, in my opinion, in Johnson County that did a complete land code rewrite. So I think we're the ones that are kind of blazing the trail into something new, and maybe we should continue to go forward with, with the new things versus striking them and going back to how they are, or you know, making them more more lenient. But maybe have them be a little bit more stringent and strict, and and make that developer you know come to the table with a better product, or you know, come to the planning commission with, well, here's the reason we're asking for a deviation. Make them work for it a little bit. That's just my 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 thoughts on on the topic that I just wanted to weigh in. So, I mean, I I can I'm I'm flexible. I everyone's you know I think we're all kind of along the same lines. Maybe something we need to look at a little bit more would be the transparency piece. It's kind of what I'm getting a general feeling for that that maybe that's where we need to, if we um, you know should. You know, deviate from staff's recommendation, you know, and come up with something a little bit more um, lenient, I'll say, or maybe a better percentage number. Um, seems like that that's kind of the consensus I've picked up from conversation that it's the transparency where we might need to uh, consider something a little bit different than what's recommended. So that's my two cents. Yeah. That I'll throw I would I would tend to agree we're, we're focused on the transparency piece here and I think it's important to remember because I just had to remind myself that we're, we're talking about the industrial building type. We're right. not talking about any other building types. It's got to be within a district that allows industrial buildings also. Um, and so from that perspective, if, if I, while I agree that we don't need to do what everybody else does just because everybody else does it and, and we can be trail setters and trend setters and all that. Uh, I'm completely on board with that and I want to make sure that our buildings look good in the city. But I also acknowledge that there's a certain limit that, such as the transparency, if everybody who wants to build a warehouse and gardener has to come in front of the planning commission, they're gonna go to Edgerton, Spring Hill, Lenexa, Olathe, somewhere else. Um, because it's easier, quicker, faster. That, uh, that I share that same concern. And, and most importantly, if with this side facility, it's with Edgerton. I mean, it's the intermodal, and we look and see what Edgertons are, and they're not that. So it, when they, the, the land is there, the maintenance are a little bit stronger in a lot of these cases, other pieces, and we, we throw some of these other complications 
you know, quote unquote in. Some people don't see it that way. That that's where I worry that we are in a competitive market, we're designing our own competitive disadvantages and maybe unnecessarily so. Um, transparency is the key piece to that. And I, I'm not a builder, so I don't know the difficulties and the extra costs it, costs, uh, it, it, it takes in and how much of a consideration that truly is when they're looking to develop between two different communities. Um, maybe it's, it's really minor and we are overthinking that. I do think we need to look at the entry one as well, the previous slide, because we have more percentages and, and, and lengths and definitions in that than anyone else that's in this list. And I don't know that you need to have a 50 foot wide main entry feature. So because if you're going 25 feet on each side of it, that have to have an enhanced facade design, that's a 50 feet entry point. And, and that's, I, that might be bigger than what the, the, the front stoop of City Hall is and nobody doubts where it goes. I, I, I think some of the, the length requirements there. Now some of the, 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 the list of requirements that we have um, that talk about um, what it needs. I think there was somewhere that talked about something that it actually needs to have in regards to qualify as a, a primary entry point. I can't. Uh, like, I yeah, they have to have at least three features, I think yes, it is. Yes, three feet. And I didn't see it here, but so you have to have three of the list of seven features. Mm -hmm. Those three should define where your, your primary entry point is without having additional transparency requirements and additional length requirements. If you can accommodate that and, and meet three of those within a, a 15 foot entryway, I feel like that does the trick, especially in a warehousing district where you know commercial business, walk-in traffic isn't going to be that primarily function. It's, it's not like walking in for pick a pack or walking into the front of Walmart. It, it's, for you to go in and get something signed and, and walk back out in most cases. So I think we need to look at the primary entry feature and we need to look at the transparency. Some of these other masking and articulation are probably, you know, on, on, on point with where we want to end up. So on the primary entry, it's like going back to what you're saying, it's, it's really it's the transparency piece that would need to be, you know, struck through keeping in the architectural ornamentation as that entry, but you're going with them removing the, uh, um, the 25 feet on each mm -hmm. side and the and 50 to 80 percent transparency, transparency because mm -hmm. I think Michelle said that the, the transparency calculation as a whole will go and I assume they're going to already incorporate most of that into the primary entry point mm -hmm. and I it, you'll have to forgive me I can't find where the list of the the three and three things are that they need to meet. it's in here but I can't yeah, get back to it there's so many pages page number it's but, uh, there's like a list of 10 things. Yes, and they need to be three of those. So, in my opinion, if, again, if, if, if I'm speaking on my own here, uh, then please just, we can move on. But I think we can strike the 25 feet and the 58 to 80 percent and just leave in the part where they need to meet at least three of those requirements. Or those three of those. Architectural ornamentation. That's it. Mm -hmm. and, and on those three other elements, where they're not, they're, they're written over here under the bulleted entry requirements, yeah. but they're not written over here under the standard language. Is an entry feature defined somewhere else to list all those, or did we inadvertently delete those? Uh, okay, the reason it's not listed in there is because our standards all, all ready say for the general industrial building type that you shall have a primary entrance feature so that where where it's listed in 1707030 that list of 10 things it says should but because it's required for the general industrial building type it changes that should to a shall so we didn't have to say they have to have the three items we just know it, it applies so there's another section that defines the primary entry features having those Correct. three things. Okay. Well, one of our alternatives here is to refer this back to staff and come back and revisit this. Do you feel like, Kelly, you have enough information based upon what you've heard from my colleagues up here to bring something back to us? Or do you guys want to try to hammer this out and give us some numbers? 
for these percentages. Well, I mean, we've, we've, we've got five minutes left on our time clock. So we can, I, I just get the feeling that we've done this before with the land development code. And when we start to get tired, we really kind of go around, around the axle. And I personally don't know what the right percentages would be on the transparency. That's, just it, huh? um, That's why I think we come back and revisit it with a refresh. You've got maybe some ideas here to how to, how to bring it back to us. Um, we point out a couple of key areas. Unless, but unless I'll, I'll stay here until whatever it takes. Y'all want to hammer right. it out. Right. We can we can hammer it out if someone feels like we're getting close to a motion. I'm I'm flexible on the transparency piece. Okay. Okay. I'll be flexible. Um, you know, and I'm flexible as well within the the primary entrance as far as transparency. We got to have the architectural ornamentation. I didn't want that struck. Everything else is good to me. But I just don't know what the numbers are, and I don't know if I could come up with them in, in five minutes or we could stay longer. That's kind of Adriana's thoughts. I'd be comfortable sending this back to staff as well. I don't know if others have a strong feeling they want to voice out. Do I would I? agree. I, I don't know what the numbers should be. I do think some of them are maybe too strict. But I don't have, I don't know what the number, I don't, that's not my, in my wheelhouse. I don't know what. Okay. So as we're looking at transparency, do we, do we all think 30% on street frontage is good, bad, and different? Because we, if we want to have staff look at a different percentage, we need to tell them which ones to look at. Or do we think 15% on all street facing facades with a 10% waiver is the better way to look at it? Yes. Yes, 30% to me seems too much. I like the 15% minimum and then up to 10%. So we just change it to 50% minimum of street facing facades That's and up to a 10% of required transparency could be waived. Okay. Good Is everyone yeah. right? Yeah, good. Okay. Then if we look at the primary entry feature one, mm -hmm. if we strike, so we have one per building minimum, we mm -hmm. strike at least 25 feet on each side. Uh, with 50, or 50 to 80 percent transparency and maintaining at least three of the defined primary entry features. Does that mean the kind of what we spoke about? Like the, the well, I'm just, um, I'm not sure exactly how they're defined as what that list of 10 things mm -hmm, are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that's in the definition of a primary entry feature, which is in a different section than what we have. In the yeah. Place. So, we don't really so I don't know how to refer back to it to, to make sure that they, because right now as I see it, nothing, I can't find anything that says they have to have three of those things. I, I feel like I missed it because I thought I saw it before, but I can't get back to where that's at. If we you want me to read to it that, to you? Yeah, where's it at? It's uh, 170730. Um, B, well, you mean in your staff report? So it's not in our staff report. It, well, it's all, it's this oh, yeah. Staff. It's, it's just summarized in your staff oh, yeah. report. It's not the gotcha. whole list. Yeah, it's okay. That so it's that, that's where I saw it. So yeah. that, that summary there. So if we just essentially have that without the, 20, the 50 to 80 percent of the 25 feet, is that where everybody kind of feels comfortable at? And the transparency, I believe, with the 50 to 80 percent transparency. Remove the 50 mm -hmm. to 80 percent transparency mm -hmm. and the 25 feet of each side. Yep, I'm good. On entry wise. I think that's. Is everybody? Yeah. Then those are the two main things. We're, yep. we're where the motion is. So, yep. you know. Can you do it? Popo's not going to show up before eight minutes or four, three minutes late. So, if so, we'll give a link and tell him just to wait outside the door. <laughs> but I think we can get the motion right? to, to there and get okay, it done. Let's do it. Yep, do it. All right. It. So. The Planning Commission, after reviewing findings in the staff report dated November 28, 2017, recommends that the governing body adopt TA-17-04 to amend the design and performance standards of section 17.07.040, specific building type standards for general industrial building type of the Gardner Land Development Code to read as follows. 17.074.040, specific building type standards, general industrial design and performance standards. Primary entry feature equals one per building minimum required on street frontage. Massing generally equals on all street facing facades, 
shall break down components of the main mass with single wall planes longer than 100 feet by using at least one of the following options. Number one, changes in the wall plane involving projections and recesses of at least one foot and extending the full height of the facade every 100 feet or less of facade length. Item two, varying roof lines or roof forms every 100 feet or less of facade length. Transparency equals 15% minimum on all street facing facades. Up to 10% of required transparency can be waived upon substitution of higher quality building materials such as solid brick, stone detailed concrete, concrete, burnished CMU, specialty glass, or architectural panels. Articulation equals horizontal and vertical breaks with similar architectural details. Materials and colors shall be used on all building facades. Such breaks may include bands of accent color, changes in materials or textures, windows and doors, exposed expansion joints, shadow patterns, expression lines, cornices, and raised parapets. All single plane changes in color, materials, and textures shall be separated or framed by expression lines, trim, or similar outlines. Ornamentation equals any other blank walls, other alt wall areas larger than 8 feet tall by 20 feet wide, 25 feet wide, excuse me, <coughs> shall be broken up by the ornamental architectural details unless the blank surface area is less than 10% of the total facade and the longest dimension of the blank surface area is less than 50 feet. Can I ask for one slight Please. change? Delete generally after massing? Yes. Well, yeah, okay. Yes. Second. Amend the motion to remove the word generally after massing. Okay, great. So we have an amended motion made by Freeman. I apologize, we have to pause. Because in our definitions on the next page, item four is defined as massing generally. Do we need to have that there for circular reference? You see what I'm saying, Brad? Okay, are, you, are you talking about massing in section 1707030? Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think you have to have it consistent. We don't have to have it. So if we leave it out in here, we won't create an error in 030. Right. Okay. As long okay. as we think that's the case. Okay. All right. Yeah. Amended motion made yeah. by. Uh, oh, we're, we're okay? Yeah, that, that's, okay. that's fine. I'm sorry. I'm looking at it. No. That's, a, sub, the, that's a subset of the okay. definition which starts massing. Perfect. Sweetness. Okay, Thanks, great. Bro. Amended motion made by Freeman with a second by Austin that the Planning Commission, after review of findings in the staff report dated November 28, 2017, recommends that the governing body adopt TA 17 04 to amend the design and performance standards of section 17.07.040, specific building type standards for the general industrial building type of the Gardner Land Development Code to read as stated on the record by Heath Freeman, Commissioner Freeman, with changes therein. Sound good? Okay, all right. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Great job, guys. Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> No. The fastest motion to adjourn ever made by Austin with the, I believe that was Freeman with the second. Indeed. Okay, great. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Meeting's adjourned. I'm not really in a hurry no. to adjourn, but <laughs> technically we technically adjourned you did it. a minute ago, so. No, that's fine. Good job sticking.